from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan. It's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. I, I can't even help it now. No, you can't do I, it. I just say it. <laughs> We were we were gonna make a, a a promo that had like wolf sounds and screaming child sounds and all this, but we, I haven't it we haven't happened. finished it. We're, so she just uh, does oh, the sound cool. effects. Does the yeah. sound effects live? Yeah, live yeah. sound effects, man. Anyway, it's kind of podcast you're on. We have a guest. <laughs> so Matthew Hagen from the Huron Valley DSA. Is that correct? Yeah, it's okay. a how it's Haugen. Haugen. How Haugen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. No problem. And so we were wondering, um, so just generally, what the Huron Valley DSA is up to these days, and then specifically, we want the dirt on your garden. Yes. <laughs> I worked on that pun all day. I just want you guys to know. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, uh, well, we, um, what have we been up to? Well, We've got last month we uh, endorsed a few candidates in the upcoming election, so we've started um, doing some stuff for them, canvassing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve Friday, who's running for U.S. Congress, um, Sean McNally uh, for the Michigan House, mm-hmm. uh, Ryan Hughes, Ann Arbor City Council, and uh, Katie Scott for Washtenaw County Commissioner. Okay, and and that's like U.S. District fifteen or thirteen. Uh, it's the seventh. The seventh district. Yeah, so it's like uh, Western Washtenaw County and Jackson, um, Lenawee County, and part of Monroe County. Got it. Okay. Okay. So like not not but not Eastern Washtenaw County. No. Got it. Okay, that's why I'm confused. Understood. Yeah. Okay, and then um, and then for the state level for Washtenaw and for the city of Ann Arbor. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, and you know, half those names I've not actually heard before, so they could, right. you know, they could use some uh, a little platform and a little, a little more discussion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, I do follow the emails. I see what's going on in the meeting notes and whatnot. But mm-hmm. at, like, like I mentioned, it's it's hard for me to get to a, a, a meeting during meetings. the week. Yeah, but um, yeah. Mm-hmm. but we do we do follow it. Um. Yeah, well, you you two have a lot going on. <laughs> uh, you could say that. Yeah. Uh, although I'm so you you've done some endorsements, but I know uh-huh. like there's you guys do lots of um, at church we call them service projects, but it's uh, I think mutual aid projects. Practices. Yes, yes. Yeah, a little practice. So we actually yeah we just had a, a brake light clinic uh, yesterday mm-hmm. in Ypsilanti. Uh, and just a kind of open that up for our listeners a brake yeah. light clinic is you know you've got a tail light that's out it's the kind of thing that the popo might pull you over for so if you get your tail light fixed it's one less thing that could be an issue for you also it's a safety concern yes yes exactly and it's um they're they're, they're cheap and it's pretty easy to do uh mm-hmm. we had a couple of mechanics a while back come come over to my place and train a bunch of us and mm-hmm. you can really teach anyone to do it in a few minutes. So right. it's a, it's a really easy way to help people. And it's one really of the, basic. one of the most common ways, um, reasons people are pulled over by the police. Yes, which then has a good chance, depending on the person of leading to a possible Escalating. negative interaction with the police yeah. to yeah. say you, euphemistically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it's one of those things that can escalate. Yeah, and you know, it doesn't even need to happen. You can fix a brake light, and it is also the kind of thing that, even if you have the money, you may not have the time. You may not know because <laughs> it's your brake yeah. light; it's behind uh, you. <laughs> no, that's that's happened. We where we've been doing these, and we like see a, someone drive by with a brake light out, and we're like trying to chase them down and flag them down. <laughs> your brake light's <laughs> out. Yeah. We'll fix it right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I had, uh, I had, I, occasionally someone will stop me in like a parking lot. Someone stopped me in a parking lot of a um, Home Depot and said, you've got like one headlights out completely and 
half your brake lights, lights are gone. I had no idea. No, oh, well, you had no idea. Yeah. Like you're yeah. just going along, and especially if you live in an urban area where you're never really in the dark. It's never really dark. It doesn't. You never jump really out. notice. Right. Yeah. But but yeah, no, I get that stuff fixed. Right. Keep talking. I'm gonna check in record levels. Don't. Okay. Mind sure. Me. Sure. Um, so a, br- a brake light clinic uh, endorsements and. Uh, yeah, um, I would say the two other big things we're working on, there's a, uh, Ann Arbor, there's a police task force mm-hmm. uh, going on in Ann Arbor to um, create a potential police oversight board. So uh, mm-hmm. we're trying to advocate with some other local groups and around do, that. Does no such board exist currently? No, there's no, nothing. So. Oh, gosh, I've I've been hearing about this for some time. Like, kind of kind of muffled talk about it for a long time there's like no, like nothing like no citizen oversight no no independent uh, review board or anything like that no so okay, yeah, so, yeah. It, it's been uh the genesis of it was in, in 2014 or rosser was killed by a ann arbor police officer and yeah. uh that's kind of how this the advocacy around it started and it led to last year city council finally passed a resolution to start the process to create one. So we want to make sure that it actually has power and some teeth. Has some teeth. And it happens. Because I, I, yeah. uh-huh. I want to say 20 years ago, mm-hmm. possibly more than 20 years ago, there was a serial rapist and um, certain groups were being targeted by the police yep. in response yep. to that rape threat. And there was talk yeah, I remember. and effort for this then. I was saying yeah. I was in Ann Arbor at that time, and I remember the. And was was that actually twenty five years ago? Am I? It was in. Uh, exaggerating. It was in the mid nineties. Right. So yeah. So it it may have been twenty three years ago. Twenty three years like ago, that. but at least twenty years ago. So there was there was a lot of conversation and mobilization around it then, and it always and then another there was another period. And I forget where they, they, they were. They were to just to, to, from what I recall, they were stopping black men on the street and yeah, testing random t- and taking blood for dna tests which yeah, uh-huh. seems like the, the suspect was a uh the description of the suspect was a black man so they just were Sub- just stopping every black like man. every black man yeah, yeah. yeah yeah right i believe what was the the guy actually turned out to be like a, a maintenance staff at university of michigan hospital something uh, like that I think, but i don't but, i don't remember for I sure don't, quite i don't quite remember the outcome of the case but it was a thing right no, the I don't civil remember, liberties yeah. was was like a bigger story than the in than the rape ways, case itself than the, rape the, case. Than the serial yeah. rapist itself yeah. himself the um and i remember We've we had conversations, I mean deep, broad conversations about it at the time, and it kind of fizzled out. And then there was another incident, which I'm forgetting, that sparked it again in the early 2000s, like maybe 2003 or four, and it kind of settled down again. Mm-hmm. So it would be really satisfying to see this actually come to fruition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like really, you know, seriously, it's it's been more than twenty years. It's time, you know. <laughs> we've been talking about it, and it's time. What well past time? And if you yeah. think about it, sort of just um, uh, strate- not strategically, uh, structurally, it doesn't make sense for an organization to investigate itself or to oversee <laughs> itself. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It just. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But that's, that that seems know. to be like the standard of practice for police <laughs> police yeah. departments. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, no, I'll see if I burglarize that house. I'll let you know. See, tell you what I find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My yeah, favorite right. is, is like this this guy, uh, this attorney office assistant who, who wrote this, uh, this uh, racist rant on Facebook uh, is, you know, was not just fired. Right. He was like suspended, meanwhile, while they're conducting an investigation. And the office is conducting an investigation to find out, like, if any of his legal work might have been compromised by his racist views, because oh. nobody's challenged, like, oh, he was hacked or something like that. There's no challenging right, or no, defense yeah. for what he said. But the thing is, I, I don't know why that has to be the standard. He's just he's an employee. 
Right. Right. <laughs> like, you know, and employees are at will. You know, he could states, just you know. be fired for having racist views, not because his legal work was impacted. So already they're bending over and offering him every possible yep. benefit of the doubt, you know. Even. Yep. Not be- no, and, right. and not even firing him because he's an embarrassment. You know, oh, right. They don't find like, that, this is embarrassing for us. We just, just have to make sure that... That he didn't open us up to li- to liability. liability. Oh, yeah. We're concerned that's, about the liability. Let's just be clear. Important. Yeah. Right. So. So yeah. So uh, that's that's pretty exciting. So you guys are now the city council's like pass a resolution saying it can't happen. Yeah, and Please, they, yeah. they they created a task force that is now uh, working to create the f- um, framework for this oversight board that they will then pass to city council to hopefully approve hopefully or, approve. Yeah. or sit yeah. back to committee yeah and see how it goes yes a little bureaucracy mm-hmm. well you know I, I i i don't have a lot of love for bureaucracy but i i do know it's best to have the conversations and go through the channels oh yeah for sure ways, right you know yeah. You miss information sure you when you do that. that. Right. Make sure you deal with all the all the T's and all the I's. Yep. And you said there was another another big thing you guys are working on. There's, oh, yeah. yeah. The other thing that comes to mind is uh, our affordable housing committee has been working with some other groups in Ypsilanti on a community benefits ordinance uh, mm-hmm. that would basically um, make any sort of – if any developer who wants to build – some sort of development if Slaney would have to negotiate certain terms with uh, with the city. the city and with citizens' mm-hmm. input. And that was born out of the uh, International Village yeah. scandal. scandal. Uh, I'm sure you two have Fiasco. read about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we have talked about it a little bit on the show okay. a while back. Um, that seems to be like a dead and buried project yeah. oh yeah it's point. gone it's gone yeah. Yeah. yeah but man that was a pretty pretty smelly <laughs> yeah that's yeah, a wild story yeah. yeah no i'm still like wow did that happen or was that like <laughs> Maybe we dream that? Was, like, was that like a fever dream <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah. happened yeah yeah and so yeah. this community benefits ordinance um and and i i know there, that uh detroit um got one but it's not doesn't have a lot of teeth. I, are you negotiating some of those hurdles? Like how are you? What what have you learned from their experiences? Yeah, that's that's what I've heard about Detroit as well. But I don't know uh, a whole lot about that. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, I haven't been too involved in our community benefits ordinance work. Oh sure, but, right. right. Um, yeah, my understanding is they had to. You know they're trying to make it as strong as they can because the people working on this are pretty good, both um, from our from DSA and from the other groups like uh, Defend Affordable Ipsy. And there's a new group mm-hmm. called Ready uh, Rising for Economic Democracy of Slaney, I believe. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think there was a couple. So initially they wanted it to have it to be like a completely independent body, separate from city city council, right? And Unfortunately, that was a non-starter with even the sympathetic city council members. So they uh, hmm. Hmm. Are, mm-hmm. had to strike that part, but trying to keep it as strong as possible in the other every other aspect. Right, right. Yeah. It, and and there was it a bureaucratic concern about having a separate body, or, or did, yeah. did they say? Did they say? I'm not sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Probably. You know, they they want to. I I think people are really sometimes hung up on certain stru- structures as they currently exist and have a hard time thinking outside of them. Oh oh yeah yeah, it's just even it's almost like a a reflex response. Like no, we can't stop doing what we're doing. Yeah. Because, you know, we're doing it, so we can't stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I'm yeah. not sure exactly, you know. But, maybe like, precisely was... what their concerns were yeah. is unclear. But, yeah. But, no, that, and that, I think that kind of inertia is in 
every organization. Well, we've been doing this, so. The same way for years. So, yeah. you know, we can't not. Yeah. Then, then what would happen, right? Yeah. And those are, those are legitimate concerns. I don't mean to dismiss them. I, I have them about my own life. Yeah. But, but yeah. You mentioned, Grace, you talked a bit about um, working, the benefits of trying to work within an organization rather than trying to circumvent or supplant it. And, um, oh, and that yeah. that got me thinking about the, just to, uh, to throw open a question about the sort of general relationship between like the democratic party today and the dsa and strategy as far as um working with the party proper uh with party members within the party as opposed to trying to do everything kind of freelance (laughs) that's an extra part right and outside the two-party system which is incredibly structurally incredibly hard to, to get traction Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on on that you'd like to to share, Matt? Yeah, well, we um, you know DSA in general has an inside outside strategy where we uh, do use the Democratic ballot line strategically uh, where it makes sense. Uh, we're not really don't really work within the party machinations itself uh, most of the time. You know, maybe mm-hmm. some local chapters do do that, but. Uh, you know, it's a it's an ongoing debate. The question of whether that or not that makes sense, because, like you said, the the structural reality of our current situation is that it's really difficult to get a third party going, and uh, it's kind of meeting people where they're at because their people's conceptions of politics right now are electoral politics and Democrats versus Republicans. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. and that's what they've got. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And well, it's a the, you know it's an ongoing debate we have, especially now with uh, all the attention from Alexandria Ocasio Cortez in mm-hmm. New York. Mm-hmm. That has renewed the debate quite a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. What's your What's your impression? I maybe we could just sort of open it up and back up a little bit and say, um, how do you? How, when did you start to get involved with the DSA and how, how do you see the trajectory of, of the group, especially in that context? And, you know, what do you see like going forward? Maybe you could, you know, whatever you want to share. I mean, maybe sure, you could sure. share a little bit about your, yourself, your, your history, uh, what, you know, why you're involved and, and, and uh, how you see the thing going. Go, right. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I joined DSA, I think, two days after the 2016 election. Um, okay. Been, you know, I had been following them along and was like sympathetic, but I didn't feel really like compelled to actually get out and do anything. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you know, I'm mostly just reading and, and stuff, but and that how, finally how, compelled me to, to join up and how, do how old are you? If you don't mind my ask 32, 32. Okay. So, so you, you count as a millennial. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then, uh, so what? What would you say was your like level of political uh, activity and uh, before that point? Right. Did you come to it already, kind of political wonky or 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 not? Wonky and active. You active. Know? <laughs> I was not active at all. I had no political active activism before that. Mm-hmm. I. You know, I I had been increasingly reading, reading stuff, and I think mm-hmm. a lot of the type of socialist, Marxist type ideas I had never really been exposed to until Bernie Sanders came along, and then I that kind of opened some things, and and before that I had been, you know, a pretty disenchanted with the whole thing because of mainly coming at it from like a civil liberties uh imperialism then mm-hmm. 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 yeah i i don't think that's a rare story i think a, an yeah. awful lot of millennials were really uh quite motivated and excited by by sanders campaign yes and yes and it, it's an ongoing mistake of the um democratic 
establishment to to minimize that and pretend that's somehow that's a like fad. a temporary aberration. So yeah. or some you know weird thing. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, and and so your what what do you think? What do you what trajectory do you see for the organization going forward? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I don't. I don't know. Uh, you know, this, we have to hopefully keep growing mm -hmm. and uh, keep, you know, the DSA was before, uh, before Bernie Sanders and the Trump election of Trump, mm -hmm. it was a, a pretty small, you know, a few thousand people nationally organization. And now, now we're at 45,000. Uh, so it's still kind of that is not trivial an awful lot of that okay. growth is is yeah, very recent yeah. right yeah mm -hmm. yeah so it's still accommodating that and kind of adapting from being a four thousand member organization to forty five thousand right uh figuring things out a bit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um and yeah so this idea that there's got to be some kind of work within the system, work outside the system arrangement. I mean, what else are you going to do with 45,000 people? You know? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking also spe specifically going back to uh, Ocasio-Cortez's campaign, the um, yeah. there's this flap now where the Working Families Party actually endorsed the Democrat mm -hmm. and, you know, all this other... And he doesn't want to step down and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And Working Families has been around some time. Yes. They're not new. And mm -hmm. part of their organizing routine, really, is to evaluate the dam and give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, usually a thumbs up, so that they appear on the ballot, mm -hmm. so that they get, so they can build name recognition. And um, part of that means you end up with something stupid like this, where actually there was someone you'd prefer that actually wins a different primary and now you've got to kind of shift all your all your game pieces mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the the general election and and mm -hmm. um and in in that respect all my dim faithful friends are like see third parties destroy everything <laughs> <I'm Yeah>. like, <laughs> like dude i I don't have time to go over the history but the party system destroys everything okay yes. let's yeah. just be clear about that yeah. one thing and then maybe we can have a conversation. But but that is this sort of, you know, I don't want to say chess game, but this this dance that you have to do if you're not in the two major parties. Yeah. Um, yeah. To even, to get anything done. To get any traction. To get any traction, to get on the ballot, to get name recognition, to pass legislation, to fill in the blank. Yeah. You've cool. got to ha kind of have one foot in each in each tent. I, w I am quite excited and hopeful about Ocasio-Cortez's uh, campaign. Campaign, but I'm I'm hoping that it represents you know a pebble that rolls you know rolls into an avalanche. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I also see already uh, the establishment is got kicked into overtime. They're putting far the, more energy into yeah. like opposing her campaign than. Yeah. I don't know, and just coming up, and the the 45? people, the, the the you know faithful Democratic voters who follow, who you know believe it starts and ends with Maddow and MSNBC and what and the Washington yeah. Post are starting to parrot these attacks. Yeah, no, it's absurd, and it really oh. reminds me of Sanders' campaign where it wasn't getting a lot of favorable press. And then the Washington Post at one point uh, just went into attack mode. You know, yeah. like they just five, five anti Sanders. No, it was like it was like a dozen, a dozen, yeah. it, oh, like bam, 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 yeah. bam. And oh, what's his name? Um, what's the matter with Kansas guy? Oh yeah, yeah, Tom, uh, Frank? Thomas Tom Frank. Thomas Frank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He uh, studied this and he looked at the coverage and he did. He wrote an article a while back. Like, what's the matter with the Washington Post? About this, uh, about this, 
like the vitriol of this attack and how coordinated right. it was and how right. and how it just turned on Sanders and how much damage that did his campaign. So no, and how it was very orchestrated. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's like you can almost reading all the editorials, you, you could almost, almost like see the, see the meeting. Yeah. You can almost <laughs> see the luncheon. The, the <laughs> meeting where they ordered, they gave everyone their marching orders. Right. Yeah. And, and so, so it's makes me a little nervous getting too deep into the, the democratic party. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course there's all these pitfalls when you're outside of it. Right. But mm-hmm. I, I'm hoping, well, let's not get too much into what I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> um, rather, what what I see is, um, or would like to see more of, it would be great if there were six or seven folks like Ocasio Cortez running, absolutely at the same yeah. time. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. that would that would really be a game changer. I mean, yeah. I, I think there's a really good chance she'll make it to Congress, and I'm sure she'll do great work. Mm-hmm. Um, but. It's going to be very limited what she can accomplish without. Of course. I mean, in other words, Sanders yeah. has been um, in elected office and he's been in D.C. Right. for decades. Right. And you just can't get much done by yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. And so. even, and I mean, he does sit on a number of very important committees and he's done a lot of important work. He's done work. a lot of important work. I mean, but I don't mean to minimize people what People still done. basically, ser- you know, supposedly serious adults still write columns about he's never had a, a job. You know, <laughs> like and never accomplished anything. Oh, you know, like he, you, like you he's know. a, like he's a, you know, a, a drifter who, a drifter you know, is like, like he's just robs cruising. gas stations or something. <laughs> for, uh, I don't even know. Like, yeah. just some absurdity. See, like it's that. either that or, or or attack him because he's got a an expensive uh, insulated coat. <laughs> he lives yeah, he in was, Vermont. He lives in know? a house and he wears a coat. What kind of yeah, socialist yeah, is yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I don't know. Yeah, just these absurdities. I am ho- I am hopeful because it does seem like um, the word socialism is not a knee jerk dirty, dirty word, word to millennials. Yeah. Right, yeah. and that that gives me hope because that's very hopeful. Yeah, because we yeah, should sure. we should at least have these conversations. Sure, I mean, and we, they we should really, be yeah. substantive. We should be talking right. about real policy. Like this is what socialism would mean in this context or socialist oriented policies would, would mean. be right yep. and it's not doesn't mean we're all you know going to become you know going to be goose stepping and marching and, or, you know, know, become Moscow, was it marxist trotsky or whatever yeah you know yeah. but but we should talk about it yeah you know? i mean if you, you want to read marx i think that's great to understand the the theory but people should understand that they don't need to be scholars of, uh, of uh, you know, it, I mean, it, it gives them some background, but they don't need to be deep scholars of, of Marx in order to understand, like, what are some of the really simple and clear benefits of some socialist-oriented policies. Right, right. Or just, I, I do think a primer on the vocabulary is valuable. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, no one needs to be a scholar, but yeah. I do think yeah. you should have some some agreed framework of what what the vocabulary what, means. What words mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah these days, even uh, words don't mean anything. Mostly, yeah, it's just it's air. so so Orwellian, you know, like the idea that Trump is a conservative. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's not even what, uh, and even conservatives aren't conservatives. Right, so, right. Um, so yeah, yeah, and um, so I think. I want to talk about the garden. Talk about the garden. Yeah, where's where I'm is trying, it? What are you planting? I, I, I'm trying to get a, trying to get a, everyone uh, loosened like, up a little bit. And, it, <laughs> and into the DSA headspace, right? You like, yes. Know what we're talking yeah. about. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, mm-hmm. but, so we have a, we have a garden. Uh, mm-hmm. It's on Platte Road near uh, off of Washtenaw. Uh, oh, is that by the um, uh, County Farm Park? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's right oh, down okay. the street from there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We used to live very close to that. Yeah, I think I, I think for I know ten, exactly what this is. For ten years, we lived there. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice it's, it's been it's been going well. We have uh, what are we growing there? It's um, we have squash, watermelon, green beans, tomatoes, corn, mm-hmm. peppers, carrots, onions. Potatoes. Oh, good. Uh, the the previous person who who had that plot mm-hmm. 
uh, grew potatoes and just and didn't clear it out. So there's like random potatoes. Yeah, volunteer uh, potatoes. Volunteer cool. potatoes. That's <laughs> the best. They uh, really, they really do yeah. like come back. Too. They really come back. Yeah. come back. Hill those puppies up. Yeah, they eat yep. them for years. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the? Uh, is there? Is this a service project? In in a sense, is there a plan for the food? So the initial plan was was twofold. One is is to get like people to learn how to garden. Uh, yeah. It, good, it's good a good practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, learn how. It's really, I learn think how. It's really important to be able to grow your own food, and I think it's going to be increasingly important going forward. Yeah, and, yeah definitely. Uh, yeah, the other thing was we we had the idea of using the food to host some kind of community dinner uh, type event oh. as like a mutual aid project, but yeah. I don't we might have bitten off a little bit more than we can chew. And I don't know if that's going to happen. I still have a hope that it's going to happen, but yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. It, uh, please tell yeah. me it's not an insurance liability thing. No, no. Okay. <laughs> now that so many groups end up like, well, we couldn't have that, dinner that, together. Cause you know, real... we needed a policy to eat in the church basement. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about the your foundational work with the St. Francis Garden and how that was organized and what you guys did with that? Because oh, maybe yeah. that's a little uh, a little sharing of ideas here. Yeah, so um, I was part of a garden project at St. Francis of Assisi Church in uh, Ann Arbor, which is like close by. When she says part of, she means she founded it and shook everyone's cage and, and demanded <laughs> to get everyone involved and agitated to create it. So. And we took um, a section of the, the rectory's lawn and we plowed it up. And I think those were the only power tools we used. Mm-hmm. Was we those used initial cutting up the, like rototilling. Rototilling the sod. Yeah. And then after that, we haven't used power tools. We haven't used any um, petrochemicals or anything like that. Not necessarily organic. It's I think people now would call it beyond organic or something, but it's always been called the Sustainable Gal- Garden Project. Galaxy brain gardening. Galaxy brain gardening. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you feel your chakras align as you garden. Yes. Um, but you know that that was you know beside the point. And every spring we would uh, we would save seed. We would every spring sell our seed to raise money for any inputs we had to purchase and. Um, we would um, then replant with those seeds and maybe introduce some new things, you know, open pollinate so we could save seeds. And um, you would the, specifically order and track down varieties that were basically open source, open they, source that were not like copyrighted or right. some They're weird. Not copyrighted. Weird we could ass, we could know. share them. We could sell them. We could pass them on. Yeah. We could ostensibly, if things ever got so tight. Yeah. That the church couldn't like you know front us a little cash, yeah. which you know they were generous and often did. Um, we could just take our seeds out from last year yep. and start again this spring, and then all the so produce you didn't have to spend more money on seeds. Right, would go to um, Perry. It was it has a new name now. It's been so long. It it's oh, not it's not the same really? name. Yeah. Is it a charter now? <laughs> it's not a charter. It's still okay. private. It's still a private uh, nursery and daycare. It was Perry Nursery School mm-hmm. over on Packard. And um, all, all the families there have some various low-income qualification to get in. Mm-hmm. And so we were supplementing their food pantry. And they would also use it in their kitchen there to prepare food for the children. Um, so the parents got to take home, take home veggies and you know, use them if, if they, yeah, if they could, thing. if they wanted yeah. to. And, yeah. and the parents loved it. It was a lot of sort of like you old-timey. A, a lot of feedback. Right. Vegetables that people recognized and enjoyed. They loved their corn, their squash, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so that that was a great project. It just did its 18th year. It's still wow. going. It's and still Grace going, yeah. hasn't been involved in it since what? 2010? Year? Yeah. So the, yeah, yeah. So it's it's in its so no, it's in its 18th year and um the joke with my friend who worked with me on it back when he, he still works there. I was like, "Hey, the garden's old enough to vote." <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so it's it's good. It's been a good project, and said lots of iterations, and people have come to chip in and bring their own um, their energy, own take. their own take, and their own energy. So it's this really really great space now, where it's got like a little garden bench and all these fe- all this fencing. Yeah, we worked with uh, our combated. Um, what was it? 
well, it wasn't groundhogs, I think it was rabbits for mm-hmm. several uh-huh. years. And but now we have I think three different garden plots there and perennials, etc. Lots of things going on, and nice. still bring produce to what is you know, it's what a is different name, a different name now, a different name, <laughs> same organization really, uh, yeah. Perry Nursery School, yeah. and um. And it, 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 there is this biting off more than you can chew thing. Yes. Yes. That's, that, that happens. There have been a couple of years <laughs> where we had to like just plant half the garden. Yeah. And it wasn't that big. It was like this. No. It was just, but it was just producing so much produce. So much food. And, and yeah. then um, I think the garden still has volunteer celery from the first year. <laughs> wow. I'm not <laughs> even kidding. Well, the, the thing about this kind of project that's so great is if you do – um, overproduce or or do like deal with have to deal with more than you bargain for. Mostly, you just have extra compost. You know, yeah. like yeah. it's not, it's not. Nothing's really truly wasted or thrown away. It, not, maybe not some truly. effort. But, I mean, yeah. it's it's certainly disappointing when you can't yeah. eat it all and you can't get yeah. someone to eat it all. It's like it's like but you yeah. talk about you know. With wind energy, if if you uh, or a solar energy, if you have a big spill, it's called a sunny day, <laughs> right? <laughs> With a garden project, if you have like uh-huh. a like your toxic waste is a, a compost, compost pile. pile. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, yeah, yeah. So what what are you, what's what's uh what's getting in your way for your your dinner? you like your like I'm assuming like a harvest dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's we just. Well, number one, I, I think just the pl- in terms of planning on like different different stuff being harvested at different times. Um, oh, right, right. Mm-hmm. And I just don't know. Like, we just have a a lot of stuff going on and a lot of work. But right, I you know, it still might happen. We'll see. Still might happen. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's very exciting. And like, and who who works on it? Is it like a workshop to come learn? Or is it like a club you join, or, or what? Uh, well, it's been early on. It was mainly uh, me and Meg, who is our the other co-chair of the chapter, and, and we're mm-hmm. both heavily involved with our environment committee, which is where this came out of. And right, sure. We had a couple other people from the committee help us out, but then um, a week or two ago, we did a, a garden day, and we got a bunch of people out to come out. And show uh, everyone around and kind mm-hmm. of familiarize them with it. And that's helped to get more more people involved to help watering and weeding and stuff. And so that yeah. was really good. Yeah, you, know, you like to say chop wood, carry water. Yeah, like to say weed the garden, <laughs> weed the garden, yeah. carry water every day. It's, it's a Grace and I are, are trying to get in our in our house in Saginaw for where we lived for seven years. Or so mm-hmm. we had a. Yeah. Uh, gradually got our gardening built up to the point where we had a whole lot of raised beds and we were oh, growing a phenomenal amount of food. Um, right. And we really, this was part of our plan when we moved up there was to do urban homesteading and really try and not, uh, we, were in, we were within the city uh, right. and so we couldn't, we weren't allowed to like raise animals and <laughs> all that. Like we could have chickens, but yeah, yeah, there were, there were we limitations on livestock. We didn't really try that. Um, mm, no. But definitely, like moving more towards getting off the grid, you know, not not literally off the grid, like we're gonna uh, just you know unplug from power, mm-hmm. but um, uh-huh. off the grid as far as maybe we could just rely a little bit less on truck farming, you know, yeah. example, and, yeah, and that's a hu- that was a huge thing for us, and we're yeah. trying to get back to that. Um, Cool. With, with uh, but yeah, and right now we've only got some very small straw belt gardening small. going yeah, on ba- here. Basically, I get a salad a day from that's the a, garden. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's so, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, you do what you can, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 But we do want to get back to that, and um, I do see this as a, a critical environmental issue. Is you know yeah. get same way, way like even. Uh, significant to get people to give up. I'm not a vegetarian, but give up one day of meat consumption. You right. know, uh-huh. just, just and one. if you can get, if you can eat off your, out of your own yard, even for three months, you know, out of yeah. the year, and even just yeah. your produce, even get just, just your produce from your yard. It's a start, and you know, in right. in World War II, everyone was urged to plant victory gardens. My grandparents yeah. uh, garden ever since. 
well, then, you know, I mean, there's deceased now, but... Uh, but yeah, they picked it up and never put it they, down. They never put right. it down. They garden right. yeah. for the rest yeah, of their cool. lives and because of that experience. Okay. And this is, I mean, we really, given what's coming mm-hmm. down the pipe, we really do need victory gardens. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And it will be a matter of survival in some communities, right. in some places. And as, really, as a matter of our fundamental infrastructure... Yeah, for society, and, and it's certainly a matter of of optim, optimizing your health in a situation where you know a lot of people in urban settings are in food deserts and can't yeah. get and, anything. And desperately food insecure. Yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, it's not gonna. Not everyone's gonna be able to raise all their own calories for sure, or their own proteins. No. But even just getting a some greens out of it, you know, I mean, how many yeah. urban uh, dwellers? could benefit so immensely from just having access to a ready source of vitamin C. And fresh you know? greens, right. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the iron and the yeah. calcium and fresh yeah, greens. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, all that stuff. As long as you can get access to some kind of a patch of soil or even a raised bed that's not part of a brownfield and contaminated. <laughs> and actually, my yes. good friends have raised beds on brown fields and have great soil and great food. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a, and, that, and that's start where you are. That's what yeah. I think is so exciting to me, at least about gardening yeah. is that it's really this portable tool. If you know how to do it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the, right. and the teaching mission I think is, is so important too, because just the way that now a lot of young people don't learn to cook, uh, Yep. Uh, the same way people don't learn to garden, the garden and to, those right. two skills together are can be really game changing for game a lot changers. of a lot of people. A lot of people. Yeah, we're so because of the way the food system is in our society set up, where most people are so disconnected from where their food comes from. And it's just like this thing that shows up on your shelf. Yeah, right. It appears. Yeah. What was that conversation we had where with our oldest? From? Yeah, like hey. Yesterday. Oh, oh, so yeah, our oldest son, a number of years ago, t- 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 this was when we only had had one child. Well, yeah, yeah, I think one or two. Uh, yeah. So, like one day, he went and got some cereal off the shelf, and he's like, "Hey, this thing was almost empty yesterday. Today, it's full. <laughs> How did that happen?" <laughs> I mean, like he, it literally never occurred to him before this moment, no, like, no. like how this happens. That, like it was uh, like magic. It, that's that's when he learned the truth about Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually your mom yes. and dad. They yeah. show up with food and keep it on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you start then you start to follow the supply chain back, and it's back a whole and back and it's back. a whole new world. <laughs> a whole new world. And you know yeah. where that came from, and yeah. further. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Cool stuff. And and so so the hope is maybe you can pull off this harvest dinner. You're doing some training and some learning, mm-hmm. and also just the the ex, the experience of gardening is valuable. Even um, even if it winds up just distributed to the volunteers, that's not a, a bad thing. Yeah, and if no. you can yeah. if yeah. you can yeah. find some. Pan, a food pantry or, or a school or something that's able to take stuff as well. I think that would right. be right. It's because it's a, it's a, it is hard to time everything. It's hard to time. It doesn't everything. always show up. Some on pantries schedule. can't tank fresh, fresh produce. Yeah. Some pantries yeah. are desperate for them. You know. We should look into that and see who we should work your network and see who would would like produce. Yeah, I would like know. fresh produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is hard. Like even you know we we plant stuff and. The the way we got our garden to work out really well was by planting a huge variety of things, yes. because a third of the crops, uh, you know, just didn't, didn't work out. Happen. Whereas some yeah. of the ones we didn't expect to work out, they just exploded. You know, yeah. and it's always there's always that element of unpredictability. So you've got to have like defense in depth. You know, <laughs> you got to have multiple yeah. things going on. So yeah, lots of plates spinning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. And you can't, you can't get stuff doesn't always work out on the schedule. We had tomatoes showing up like volunteering in October, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, it was absurd. It was absurd because you know, if one of the things with raised bed gardening, and we were doing some like hyper permaculture stuff, and mm-hmm. cool. layer, layer all this stuff together, right? And, and um, this stuff feeds that stuff, and and so on. You develop these microclimates, so we would have these tomatoes ripening in October. Without cold frames, 
Yeah. It was really it was surprising. So, yeah, it was really surprising. Wow. Yeah. So there's so much out there, but it's also important just to kind of get some of these basics down and then you can yeah. do all kinds yeah. of fun stuff. We really, yeah. our, our goal here and there too was eventually to have a real permaculture food jungle where we had a, a huge variety of food that required not a lot of traditional agricultural like maintenance Inputs, work. maintenance yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, you know, you get out you know, of the garden every day, but... We were yeah. we were huge into mulching and really hated weeding, so part of the thing was to kill our lawn first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Death to the lawn. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. We need to replace lawns with... Food. Edible. <laughs> yes. Edible gardens. Or even, if you can't, if you're not going to eat it, at least like ivy or something. Or like something. That. Yeah, at least some native plants and wildflowers and yeah, stuff like that. Definitely. Something worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I think are we there? Is that is that you, what we're looking for? Is, is there, there more, Matt? Yeah. Is, is there any, anything else you'd like to bring up uh, in our first chat? I mean, I think uh, I think we'll be we'll be calling you back, Matt. Yeah, we'll be calling you yeah. back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was great. I, I don't know. I can't can't think of anything else. Okay, thank you so much for taking the time. It is a a yeah. school night, uh, <laughs> and so uh, we're we're not going to stay up super late. Yeah. This yeah. this show we're actually recording ahead, which is something we like never get to, never do. Get to do. But we're we're trying it to feels record. So decadent, yeah, know? like oh, we're always like recording at eleven thirty yeah, at night, nice. and then I still have to do two or three hours of production work. So I'm getting right. to bed oh, wow. at two thirty in the morning on Sunday nights. But so maybe. Yeah, we just dropped a show uh, to earlier tonight, and then. We'll get this one out probably next Sunday, probably next time, next and it Sunday. could be part of a two-parter because um, it's relatively short. I'm not quite sure, but we'll we'll, we'll let you know. And then right. we're uh, yeah, and if we can, we're going to try and do two interviews next weekend too. And then maybe we even have like an extra show in the or two, like in the can in case we have a crisis and can't because <laughs> that happens. Get a show out because that yeah. happens pretty regularly. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah, Appreciate thanks for it. Me. Okay, so um, yeah, we're babbling. Uh, I'm disorganized because we're stressed because it's late and um, it's late on a Sunday night. We spent the whole day cleaning yeah. and feeding our children and arguing with them. We got so here we are now, <laughs> Yay. ready, ready, well rested and ready to go. Cha um, cha cha. So we recorded an interview with Matthew Haugen last weekend. And yeah. I'm going to include this, that, and then this is going to be a continuation of that. Right. So when you're listening to this, you'll be thinking, well, duh, I just listened to the interview with Matthew. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so it'll all make sense. So when It'll all come out in the wash. It should be fine. You should be okay and secure listening to our voices. Yes. Blathering. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about the house situation and uh, what you found when you went up to uh, to check in on everything and meet with the attic contractors. Yeah. So tell us what you found. <laughs> so I've got to get up there. It was last Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. I've got to get up there at 8 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. It's an hour and a half away. Yeah. So I get there precisely at 8 o'clock. I'm jumping out of the car. I managed to get you out, out the door. God, yeah. God bless you. You had to borrow my car because my car is working air conditioning and Which yours doesn't. Which was very valuable on the way on the return trip. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Uh, and uh, I grabbed my phone and it's flashing. I didn't hear it ring while I was driving. Yeah. Which, you know, honestly, I'm grateful for. And I call the last number. It's the attic company. The guy got there like five, ten minutes earlier, let himself in with... At, the, at 7.55 or there. Like 7.55. Yeah. Like, you know. Let himself in with a lockbox code, and as he starts to go up the stairs, he sees two people jumping out what we refer to as the boys' bedroom. First floor bedroom window. Like a first floor bedroom window. Two people are jumping out the window. So he just like, well... I'm leaving the building and goes and waits at his car mm -hmm. calls in and they called me. Yeah. And so that, that was the message I was responding to that the call that I missed. And I'm like, what? Hey, and I'm looking around and there's like an old bike trail, like a trashy old bike trailer um, that someone had pulled from the garage. The garage door has been forced open. The, the first floor bedroom window 
is standing open. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, hey. Wait, is he still here? He didn't leave because I just got here. And he's like, yeah, yeah, he's here. He's here. Yeah. So I went out and ca- called him back in and et cetera, et cetera. Checked through the house. No one was in the house. Uh, but someone had, had uh, busted in um, maybe to look for something to take. We don't know. Uh, but, but they didn't break the, a lock or a They did not break a lock. They did not, there was no sign of forced entry to yeah. the house. Yeah. Um, clearly, someone forced the lock. It was a padlock on the garage door mm-hmm. and got it to get into the garage. But no one, no one had forced entry into the house. I'm guessing there was someone who either knew the, the lockbox code mm-hmm. or uh, had enough time to wait and watch. Yeah. And was coming to strip um, copper is my guess. Maybe that, that's my guess. Yeah. But you know, I don't really know. File the police report. We'll find it. We'll get a, a case number next week. Uh, the city of Saginaw doesn't even come out for property crimes. They come out for gunshots. That's when they show up. Yeah. Short so, of that, they they really don't show up. So if they're in your house and someone's casing it and arranging to come in and strip the copper pipe and the wiring for scrap metal. Um, they you just can't don't. necessarily get the police to even come and to do anything to do anything right I mean any kind of anything you know so so we're putting all this money you know it's a, a, a bunch of it is the insurance company's money, money but, but a bunch of it is ours as well a bunch we're of it is ours for where, things that are let's covered. just be very clear yeah about where the insurance company got that money well, <laughs> yeah, we paid them for eight years. We right? paid them for you know, right. so for years. So we're, now, and it's been quite a, a lot of effort on your part oh, to right, arrange to all work, this to arrange it all. and get all the contractors out. Yeah. We're putting all this effort and, and time, and we're trying our, our hardest, literally everything we can possibly afford to do, and then some. Right, going into debt, you know, further to try to to try to um, maintain get and, the maintain it and get it ready for sale and get it attractive for for sale right, and just really leave the house on its best foot and the best right. that we can given right. our given limited resources and time, time and the fact that we're not even living in the same city anymore right and we so, already and we have a new mortgage ta-da. right but now we're worried that someone's going to be stripping the joint in the house damaging and doing further damage and and whatnot while we're while right. we're getting this this work finished up. So it's, do we it's get a really, security camera? It's I don't know. it's crazy. It's a crazy yeah. situation. We're, so we feel like we're in a, some kind of a race against time mm-hmm. to get this sold. Yeah. And but yet yeah, again, we're trying to fix it up as best as we can because it's our investment, honestly. <laughs> yeah, such as it is. <sighs> a, a investment that we're trying to catch as it's falling. Yeah. Right. And, and not catch and the not, blade. Yeah, and and not just falling, but being th- being you know, thrown thrown down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, so that's where that stands. We're it's not on the market yet. Huzzah. We still have. Yeah, and this is another thing that you know everyone tells you: don't pay your contractors until they're done, done, oh, done. Oh, motherfuckers! Uh, and motherfuckers. you have absolutely no leverage with contractors if you've paid them. And we we've been had this lesson shoved in our faces in. Sp- Spades, you know, straight with one particular with contractor. one particular contractor, and we knew this lesson, right? But the contractor, we this was like our third added contractor. We were desperate to get and this none of work them done. would start work without payment first. They wanted full full payment first to even start. To even and start. So and we're this like, is all right. Well, we really don't have a choice. We're right. we're pretty desperate here. And every contractor for the same work had the same clause. Clause. Yeah. They would not touch anything until they'd received 100% so, payment. So we paid them. And right. we got paid most of that back by the insurance company, but yeah. but we paid them. And they have not they have still not finished. And still they've finished. they've blown us off over and, and over and over, over and just not called, not done anything. Not sure not done anything. And when you do go and inspect it, you're like, This isn't done. And you like, left all this, this junk, including like clothes and stuff. Like what? I mean seriously, what? <sighs> it's so it's just Yeah. They're supposed to come back and finish. We'll see. It's just been a a real snow. endless bullshit. So the only leverage I have is uh, if they if they have a if this if they've like blown us off for the third time and just not shown up to finish the work, I'm going to to talk to the credit card company about reversing their payment. 
right until they are, are they actually done. deliver the work yeah so yeah it's one of those things right. um was there i i think that was it police report la 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 okay yeah I, I think that was it you know well so i have uh, a number of books i want to discuss briefly yeah and then we have a book we want to talk about in a little more depth yeah Okay, so the brief books in brief. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we started, was there anything else you wanted to say about the news of the? We haven't really had a. Oh, we haven't done like a current events. Current thing. events. Thing. I'm not. I'm not too much into current events. I just. I don't know. I'm really shaken by this. Uh, that thing. Oh, the boat. The, the boat disaster where all these the people died. Boat. The duck boat. Yeah. Seventeen people died. Nine of them. Or More than half members of one members family. of one family, three generations of one family. A woman lost all three of her children. Yeah, uh, that that's. I just can't even. Yeah, it's so. And the thing, I, I kind of pisses me off. Um, the people chartering this thing, the, like the the people who made the money. Yeah. Told them not to take their life jackets, and they didn't need life jackets. I'm thinking if you're in more than three feet of water, you need a life jacket. I, it just should be policy that if you're on a boat, you're wearing a life jacket. You're just wearing a life you jacket. You know, I mean, I, I, yeah. That and not that would that would have that would have saved lives. I really don't know if it would have saved everyone, but I don't it, know if it would have saved everyone, have, but it really and, could have saved lives. Yeah. And um, I was oh, I was reflecting with a friend of mine the other day that the, I don't know if this is a cultural or regional thing, but none of us that grew up on the coast have that kind of cavalier attitude about the water. Yeah. We're not afraid of the water. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you we have respect a certain it. certain respect for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That you know, you can be out on a calm day and need your life jacket to yeah. make it home. I mean, I really I don't know enough of the detail to know who to to blame and criticize, but it I, the other thing I've heard is that these boats are really antique, you know. Yeah. They're like Real vintage hey, things, and I appreciate a well-maintained vintage antique. Anything, but they're not <laughs> not seaworthy. Not, they're not really safe. Not waterworthy. Yeah. In anything other than very placid, you know, lake conditions. Right. And, and, and not that I think people need blame and recrimination. No. But uh, we do need to see that uh, this doesn't happen again. Is there any? Yeah. Is there any restorative justice to be had when you've lost your entire family? I, I don't know. I don't know. Is there, is there any comfort in, in right. putting the company I mean, out of business? Or, what's she going to do, sue them? Or getting getting a law passed, a regulation uh, right, passed, right, or something like yeah. that, and everyone's screaming about excess regulations. You know, blah, like, blah, blah. But you know. It, it may not even be a regulatory thing. There are probably regulations that weren't being followed. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's... Right. My only concern is that this doesn't happen again <clears throat> if it's at all avoidable. Yeah. Um, and the, the sudden nature of the storm and the violence of the storm, the yeah. unpredictability of that does seem to me like there's probably a climate change connection there and that oh, yeah. all of these, um, all the kids in the cave, it's yeah, yeah, all of these things are, it seem are related to this increased volatility, volatility. and where, you know, we're you can't, breaking we're breaking established patterns right. of weather and so think it's not business as usual. The extra kinks in the um, jet stream, the volatility in the mm-hmm. jet stream, and the extra moisture in the atmosphere. You know, mm-hmm. suddenly it's not. It's not like the storms that you're used to. So. Right. Well, no, and so, and suddenly, the place where you always go hiking in September, yeah, is yeah. dangerous in September. Yeah. You never go there in December or January because it's dangerous. Now it's dangerous in September right. too. I did. I did want to mention the uh, the kids in the cave too, because oh, that, yeah. that was a story I was following with trepidation and fascination. Yeah. And it's it's a perfect news story in the sense that people can talk about it endlessly. Yeah. But unless you're on the ground there, you and do. you're and you're a experienced cave diver, nothing you can do. There's uh, there's literally nothing you can do. Thoughts just, and prayers. It's just like thoughts and prayers. It's just this useless energy, mostly beating against. You know, if you're driving and listening to the car, like 
listing in the car. It's like beating your fist against the steering wheel is the only thing you can do. <laughs> well, no, and that, and this is not to say that thoughts and prayers are useless. No, but yeah, I was fascinated. So that's what you can do? I, here's and I, I actually I wrote something on Twitter about how. And this was before I fully understood what they actually did to mm-hmm. accomplish, to achieve, to get all the kids out. Mm-hmm. I was contrasting like Elon Musk's proposed mini sub, right? This like let's let's apply technology to this situation, and you know, flow, you know, fly in and and do some untested experimentation of a new rescue technology on brown people who can't sue us right you know or yeah um let's do that that'll be great great idea and you know it people are still defending him but that was never realistic given what we know about the geometry of the the cave system right that it couldn't have even fit through the places where they fit people through right i was contrasting that saying and instead what they're doing is actually applying their local wisdom you know, mm-hmm. which is they were teaching the kids to meditate. They mm-hmm. were training the kids to dive. They were keeping them calm. They were working out, you know, and and doing this really heroic work mapping the cave yeah. system. Plus the, yeah. I mean, let's not downplay the effectiveness of um, this these massive pumping systems they installed to get rid oh, of yeah. a lot of the water so yeah. that... So that which is technology, yeah, you know, but appropriate, appropriate, proven technology, yeah, and so, which meant that in parts of the the uh, cave they could walk, they through could actually it, walk through, through it. it, right? right. But um, yeah, I was really impressed by the idea that they were actually going to train these kids to to dive to some extent, right? And I was like, that's amazing that they right. can do that. But I was also terrified for them because I'm like, it's hard to believe that, you know, these, even these very dedicated, bright, you know, kids who've been tutored in meditation and, you know, centering themselves and and all that. Stealing themselves for it. That's got to be unbelievably terrifying. And it's hard to believe that they could get them all, especially if they're in a weakened condition, all through this, you know, like hours underwater. Mm Mm-hmm through these little claustrophobic passages yeah. without anyone panicking right. and panic means you die. Yeah. Right. And then I heard what they finally did and I'm like, mm-hmm. that is brilliant. Yeah. Which what, was yeah. to actually bind them up to stretchers so and put a full face mask on them. So they had oxygen in there mm-hmm. and they weren't in charge of their own oxygen. Right. And then give them, I don't, still don't heard all the details, but some kind of sedative mm-hmm. such that they, literally could doze or at least be Just completely relaxed. calm right. through the very the terrifying <laughs> parts of the ordeal. Right. right. And then have two experienced divers yeah, on carry them all the, on either side, carry yeah. them all the way out. Pull them through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Quite literally. <clears throat> it's, yeah. it's amazing that they, it's a brilliant and amazing achievement that actually everyone made it out. Yeah. Because it was not by any stretch of the imagination, a, a, a given. No. Well, no. except that one guy didn't. We should remember that yeah. one diver did die one trying diver did to drive. stage oxygen tanks right. and and prepare the route for Really one of the first work. people in to prepare the work. One of the pioneering people. Right. Yeah. That, and, as I say, the vanguard. And we should remember him because I think he would have as I wanted he came to out of- be remembered for the fact that eventually all the kids were rescued. Right. Yeah. And this is a man who came out of retirement to do it. Yeah. He was not active. He was retired. And, um, yeah. you know, did the right thing. That's a heroic That's heroism. guy. Anyway, th- that's a, a piece of the news. Uh, you know, you can... Yeah. It's easy to make fun of Musk, and I think people should. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Every day if you can. <laughs> I mean, when the opportunity presents itself, don't but, go looking, you know. But mostly, it's just a case of someone trying to engage in some egoic self-aggrandizement and promote his, you know, yeah. business interests. Um, and you know, if he, if his company wants to produce a line of mini rescue subs and test them and make them available for this kind of thing in the future, right great. Ahead. That that's great. But don't be sure you have signed you, consent for yeah. it. <laughs> for your test subjects just saying and don't pretend you can you can parachute into any situation and and fix it 
you know. Yeah. Anyway, I want to I want to talk about some books I've got yeah. in the mail because I've got been uh, ordering been some piling books. Up books. I got pile piles got books of books all over the damn place. Um, there's lots of nonfiction, lots of serious nonfiction, but I also spend time just about every week reading some fiction. Yeah. So I got a copy of the Centipede Press Library of Weird Fiction, Arthur Machen, which is a, a collection of, um, I guess you'd call it uh, weird fiction. It's yeah. a. I'd call most of your fiction weird. But that's <laughs> you know, that's me. So. This is specifically known at the time and uh, as in, in the context, genre uh, as weird fiction. That's weird. You know, okay, yeah, like that. Yeah, and it's it's fantasy, okay. right? And fairly dark fantasy. And oh, mm-hmm. Machen was a, a forerunner of writers like Lovecraft, right? Oh yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and. Um, kind of a contemporary of William Hope Hodgson mm-hmm. who also was into that weird fiction thing. Wait, so a former a forerunner to Lovecraft but contemporary with him or No, contemporary with Hodgson. More and or Hodgson less. was Oh, was, World was, was War Hodgson I. was like oh, was World War 1. Love, Lovecraft was World War 2. I thought Lovecraft was later. Really? A little later. Okay. My mistake. I'm sorry. I'm just get my dates screwed up it's it gets a little complicated because Machen actually had quite a long career okay but a lot of his most famous stuff was written uh in around 1900 1910 okay and okay and Lovecraft was like the 20s yeah and then he also wrote uh stuff um the right contemporaneous with world war Mm one so anyway this is a beautiful book Uh, and I really, I, I'm willing to spend money, like real money, on uh, well-made hardcovers. Oh, yeah. And by real money, I mean, I don't feel, uh, f- this was uh, $40 for a hardcover, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's beautifully sewn, it has nice artwork, it has a very solid cover and a nice dust jas- d- dust jas- jasket. A jasket. Dust ja- d- it sounds dirty. Dust jacket. Thank you. And, um, yeah, I mean, but the press that puts this stuff out also puts out these extremely limited edition books, like they have a version of Gene Wolfe's uh, Book of the New Sun, mm-hmm. where there are these massive illustrated volumes and they, a, a used copy of Claw of the Conciliator. Is the, there's one copy on eBay. It's listed at four hundred and nineteen dollars, <laughs> right? And I would love to have that whole series in this nice edition. Not four hundred, but it, they were like signed and numbered, limited editions. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's that too. So yeah. So what, what's this book? What's going on in this weird fiction? So this weird fiction. I'm going to read a bit here. Yeah, do it. Okay. Uh, I gotta jump ahead because this was all stuff from my blog. I read a story called, um, not intended to be ironically, "The White People," <laughs> which is one of his most famous stories. Oh, really? A British man wrote a story about white people. <laughs> Strange, unusual. <laughs> uh, no, but um, not actually. Well, by the white people, he meant really white like uh like ghosts like ghost like like elves okay. like uh, elves and fairies mm-hmm. so this is a passage um his style in this story is sort of a stream of consciousness style he's channeling uh its framework where in the middle of it you're reading uh the journal of a 16 year old girl right from like oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 75 years earlier mm-hmm. so i'm gonna try this I hope I can get through it because I didn't really have enough dinner. <laughs> so anyway. I tried again to see the secret wood and to creep up the passage and see what I had seen there, but somehow I couldn't, and I kept on thinking of nurses' stories. There was one I remembered about a young man who once upon a time went hunting, and all the day he and his hounds hunted everywhere, and they crossed the rivers and went into all the woods and went round the marshes, but they couldn't find anything at all, and they hunted all day till the sun sank down and began to set behind the mountain. And the young man was angry because he couldn't find anything, and he was going to turn back, when just as the sun touched the mountain, he saw 
come out of a break in front of him a beautiful white stag. And he cheered to his hounds, but they whined and would not follow. And he cheered to his horse, but it shivered and stood stock still. And the young man jumped off the horse and left the hounds and began to follow the white stag all alone. And soon it was quite dark, and the sky was black without a single star shining in it, and the stag went away into the darkness. And though the man had brought his gun with him, he never shot at the stag, because he wanted to catch it, and he was afraid he would lose it in the night. But he never lost it once. Though the sky was so black, and the air was so dark, and the stag went on and on till the young man didn't know a bit where he was. And they went through enormous woods, where the air was full of whispers, and a pale, dead light came out from the rotten trunks that were lying on the ground. And just as the man thought he had lost the stag, he would see it all white and shining in front of him, and he would run fast to catch it. But the stag always ran faster, so he did not catch it. And then, and they went through the enormous woods, and they swam across rivers, and they waded through black marshes where the ground bubbled, and the air was full of will-o'-the-wisps, and the stag fled away down into the rocky, narrow valleys, where the air was like the smell of a vault, and the man went after it, and they went over the great mountains, and the man heard the wind come down from the sky, and the stag went on, and the man went after at last the sun rose, and the young man found he was in a country that he had never seen before. It was a beautiful valley with a bright stream running through it, and a great big round hill in the middle. Mm. So maybe that seems like just like a run-on sentence to you. <laughs> and I, maybe. I didn't read it that well because I kept losing my place because I can't see my page that well. <laughs> but, and it is kind of a run-on sentence. Yeah. But... But that's one of the most evocative yes passages I've I've ever heard. It's it right. is a um, a passage into the land of fairy, right? Right. Where and this is actually kind of a tradition where someone Tolkien writes about this too. Right. In some of you his follow poetry, follow the white stag or the bunny or the yeah, thing, and you emerge in in the land of fairy and some and, other place. Yeah, because you lose track of where you're going, you'll never find your way back. Right. Right. Or you you find your way back, and then a thousand years have passed. Or, years yeah, back. yeah, yeah. There's all these traditions having to do with storytelling like that. Like but, Brigadoon, Dune, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Machen is is like this, but wrote in many different styles, and um, was considered an occultist. You know, he mm. wrote a famous story called "The Great God Pan," mm-hmm. which maybe what people were pretty horrified and disturbed by he was writing in a really you know edwardian era era and frame of mind yeah and the edwardians were yeah completely fucking decadent (laughs) (laughs) like in every respect yeah you know well it's it's weird to me how at the same time that you know the same era that brought us world war one yes also brought these stories of bizarre existential horror and technology you know i don't that doesn't seem contradictory no it's not but it's no, it, it, it yeah it, it's they're like closely related. It, they're closely related in the same way that the history of japan helps explain gojira you know yes. godzilla phenomena right gojira. yeah so i i don't know i I have only, this is the only story of Mockins that I've actually read, but mm-hmm. it's a beautiful story and I'm excited about um, reading more from this, uh, from this big omnibus volume. Mm-hmm. There is a typo that I thought was really funny though. Oh yeah. It's clearly an OCR error because this was probably scanned from an old text. Right. Instead of um, her eyes shone in the dark like burning rubies, the line goes, her eyes shown in the dark like burning rubles. Mm. Like, wow, Vladimir Putin gets into everything. everything. His hands are everywhere. Anyway. Dirty bastard. Are you making the speed it up gesture? Is that what you're doing? I did like 30 seconds a minute ago. Sorry. I'm, I'm trying. It's okay. But what's the next story? What's the next thing you read? Well, the next thing 
is I, I, I've been curious about Michael Moorcock. And yeah. Michael Moorcock has written many, many books. He's a famous fantasy author. He's actually 70-something now, maybe mm -hmm. 80. Um, and he's most famous for a lot of his stories that originally started, started appearing in the early 1960s when he was just like 20, you know, mm -hmm. or very, very young. Right. So the most famous series are the Elric stories, Elric of Melnibone. Mm. It looks like Melnibone. Melnibone. You're supposed Mel to Nibine. say, supposed to say Melnibone. There's an accent on the final oh, E. e. And so I have been curious about these, and I noticed there's a nice edition by Glanx, this British publisher slash Orion mm -hmm. books, and I ordered them. So that's seven books, <laughs> the El yeah. Elric stories. And they descended upon our home. And they descended upon our home. They all wound up in the mailbox packaged in individual on like little individual mailing packages as one does and uh, i remember i had rocket get the mail to jump out of the car and get the mail and i, I looked over and she's actually like bracing herself against the mailbox and pulling with both hands yeah, with all her might to try and pry these out of the mailbox because the yeah. the mail carrier had literally wedged them in and then, like, and uh, then tied it shut. Tied the mailbox shut with a rubber band because it wouldn't close. <laughs> like, She's wow. Like, Why are these people on the damn books? Dedication. <laughs> uh, so, seven volumes Elric of Melnibide and other stories, Elric the Fortress of the Pearl, Elric the Sailor on the Seas of Fate, Elric the Sleeping Sorceress and other stories, Elric the Revenge of the Rose, Elric Stormbringer with an exclamation point afterwards. And Elric, the Moonbeam Roads. Now, what's you've made a discovery about these books, though. I made a discovery about these books. So I was thinking uh, I would just read uh, these books. Mm -hmm. So these books prevent, uh, prevent, present all the Elric material in what you might call in-universe mm -hmm. chronological order. Mm -hmm. And... Um, what that means is that you're reading initially a lot of stuff that was written much later. Like right. Much later in the publication history of the Elric stories mm -hmm. when um, Moorcock was considerably older. Right. So, like some of, the, like in the 80s as opposed to in the 60s or right. even in the some 90s. Some of it was like 30 years later. Yeah. And I discovered that. Um, you know, having done a bunch of reading in these books, having finished the first two, mm -hmm. and then having said, you know what, let me try and read them in publication order, order instead. Yeah. What you just what you discover is that originally the the uh, Elric story appeared over the course of a just a just like th three years, two or three years, mm -hmm. in uh, in this fantasy magazine, right? And it's a lot more fun to read mm -hmm. the original novelettes. They weren't even novellas. They're about the original like stories, but like 40 pages, pages each or so when printed, mm -hmm. five chapters. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly how many words, 12,000 words, maybe, maybe. Uh, something like that. Right. Not but even NaNoWriMo. They don't, <laughs> they don't, maybe 20. I don't know. I didn't try and count, but they don't live up to uh, being considered novellas, except the last couple were, I guess, reached novella length. Mm -hmm. But these, I have to say, having read late Mork, having late Elric stories and early Elric stories, that the early ones are much more energetic. Mm -hmm. And I, it, I guess it makes sense that you would argue that, well, you know, the original ones, you come in really late in the story, and then like there's like nine novellas, and then he dies, right? Right, right. <laughs> So why All not the rest of it? Why not? You know, and so an awful lot of it is crammed in between. Yes. And it's like, well, it's confusing to start. And people might say it's confusing to start in media res, as you say, like in the middle of the story, which is where mm -hmm. the novella, the first novella starts. But I say that's fine. That's fine. It's Star fine. Wars started in the middle. You, it's it's. Uh, long and noble tradition to jump into the middle, of the story. especially in a short form. Yeah. To jump in the middle, and then along the way, you figure out what's going on. Yep. 
that's fine. There's fine. nothing wrong with that. And, and in fact, all the people who grew up loving Moorcock yeah. and read them in, in publication order. <laughs> right, read them in publication order and, you know, you know at least it, we're fine with it. Yeah. And they well, didn't miss what, out. What you have later on are effectively all the prequels yeah. that he's spooling out as he keeps thinking about his story. Right. Right. Which isn't necessarily Yeah. What anyone wants to read? Maybe. And Maybe. he's also done <clears throat> a lot of the the later stuff are novel length. Right. And then he's also done this thing, I should say Moorcox published something like seventy fantasy novels. A Which large is hard for me to even wrap my head number. around. But, yeah. <laughs> but he's he's tried in uh the over the course of welding everything together and collecting and recollecting and editing and republishing things to kind of retcon everything into one big messy world world universe story called right. and where elric is one of several eternal champion characters which are fairly interchangeable in that they don't have a lot of characteristics other than being recurring eternal right. champions right. yeah and he calls this sort of framework the multiverse where people can travel and jump back and forth between stories and reappear in stories. And I just want to say, that's fine for Michael Moorcock. <laughs> but honestly, as a reader, I don't care. You're not into it. And uh, reading some of the later, like the more modern novel, um, he's even throwing in references to London. You know, and he's oh, he's yeah. bringing in characters from another renamed characters from another uh, arc of his called the Jerry Cornelius stories, right? And if you've read all that, that's funny. It's like a recognition moment and all that. It's like but an in joke. It, it's an in joke. It does nothing for the story, right? And if you're not into you know the Jerry Cornelius stuff I read a while ago, I didn't really like even. Right. So bringing in him. Like does nothing for me except make me roll my eyes and like now it, let's just get through this. There's a way in which people do appreciate that though. I yeah. just want you to think about all the Harry Potter fans who are ready to read anything that comes out. Because it's less about the story and more about the community and the relationship. Yes. Yes. Right. And sharing the in jokes. Yeah. And getting yeah. the in jokes and passing the in joke on. Okay, so I'm not gonna say I'm not, not gonna. I'm not gonna say that you should forego all the later stuff. Sure, no. What I'm gonna say is, you really should, if you're new to this stuff, if you're n new to Moorcock and new to Elric, you should read the original novelettes in more in or less in order, order. in publication, publication order, order. Right. and you should let that be your experience of what. Elric is like because frankly that's the experience all these fans who are in on the story now had, had. That, that's what they had that many, brought them many to this of point. them many I mean yeah. depending on their age and, sure you know. sure okay I want to read a little this is a little taste of this is old old Barcock okay the dreaming city the first novelette from 61 or 62 mm -hmm. it's quite quite a while ago drawn up on the beach a tiny sailing boat lay Elric's own small craft, sturdy, oddly wrought, and far stronger, far older than it appeared. The brooding sea flung surf around its timbers as the tide withdrew, and Elric realized that he had little time in which to work his helpful sorcery. So, uh, you probably hear it, but I just want to point out all the alliteration in those sentences, yeah. right? I love this shit, mm -hmm. you know? Right. His body tensed, and he blanked his conscious mind, summoning secrets from the dark depths of his dreaming soul. Swaying, his eyes staring unseeingly, his arms jerking out ahead of him and making unholy signs in the air, he began to speak in a sibilant monotone. Slowly, the pitch of his voice rose, resembling the scarcely heard shriek of a distant gale as it comes closer. Then, quite suddenly, the voice rose higher until it was howling wildly to the skies, and the air began to tremble and quiver. Shadow shapes began slowly to form, and they were never still, but darted around Eric's body as, stiff-legged, he started forward towards his boat. His voice was inhuman as it howled insistently, summoning the wind elementals, the sylphs of the breeze, the shuras, makers of gales, 
the Haharna, the Haharshans, builders of whirlwinds, hazy and formless, they eddied around him as he summoned their aid with the alien words of his forefathers, who had in dream quests taken ages before, made impossible, unthinkable pacts with the elementals in order to procure their services. Mm. Still stiff-limbed, Elric entered the boat, and, like an automaton, ran his fingers up the sail and set its ropes, binding himself to his tiller. Then a great wave erupted out of the placid sea, rising higher and higher until it towered over the vessel. With a surging crash, the water smashed down on the boat, lifted it, and bore it out to sea. Sitting blank-eyed in the stern, Elric still crooned his hideous song of sorcery as the spirits of the air plucked at the sail and sent the boat flying over the water faster than any mortal ship could speed. And all the while, the deafening, unholy shriek of the released elementals filled the air about the boat as the shore vanished and the open sea was all that was visible. Mm. Anyway... I just sorry about that if you don't like fantasy, but uh, I just wanted to share a taste of the first novelette, right? Right, where he was really engaging. He was really writing with unbridled energy. Yeah. Nabokov called that writing ecstatically, right? And right. you know, I, I don't know whether he was uh, imbibing in substances or binging on whatever, Heart but set? he was young and. And it shows. Young and exuberant. And it shows. Exuberant and ecstatic yeah. writing. Yeah. So that's fun to read. And yeah, it's dated and sexist. But the other thing is you realize that he, Moorcock was like everywhere in popular culture in the 60s and 70s. Like a lot of my favorite albums from the 70s and 80s mm-hmm. use fantasy tropes that are right out of Moorcock Straight stories. Out of Moorcock, right. Yeah. Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, did songs he actually wrote some of their lyrics he wrote Mm -hmm. veterans of the psychic war uh the song veteran of the psychic wars the song black blade was literally Mm -hmm. about elric elric and his black blade yeah right anyway (laughs) i'm supposed to be winding it up i want to say something about elric though oh yeah what what about elric uh he's kind of a frustrating guy i mean who wouldn't want to have a tall and graceful necromancer as a buddy? Right. He's always good for a fun day out, but things tend to get out of hand now and then. Uh, he starts screaming, Blood! Blood and souls for my lord Ariok! And slays a whole city full of ancient towers and burns their libraries. Yeah, and you start to feel like maybe you need to widen your circle of friends a little Just, bit. You know, get some space. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yet you're kind of addicted to the unpredictability. One day you're fighting shoulder to shoulder with Elric in a magical bog filled with eldritch mist, mm-hmm. battling giant worms from another dimension, and Elric's rune sword, Stormbringer, decides that it's still hungry and sucks your soul right out of your body while Elric tries in vain to control it. That yeah. kind of thing can really spoil a bromance. Yeah, it's kind of sad that way. Anyway, mm-hmm. so this is not, these books are not for everyone. These stories are not for everyone. But yeah, no. my whole point is they are fun to read, the novellas especially, the old stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you are trying to get into them, I recommend skipping the... Um, the newer stuff for the, for the beginning. Uh, read, it, read them in publication order. For, yeah, yeah. And um, I've written about this stuff and continue to write about this stuff at great length. At great length. On my blog. So, you know what? I should probably save um, Orwell. Oh, yeah. Orwell is kind of like a discussion of his own. I, I have actually a long section that I've highlighted to quote, but I'll just mention that, that we've been reading down We're still and out. reading. We're still reading to the kids as a bedtime story, down and out in Paris and London. Yeah. Uh, occasionally censoring a bit here and there. But, oh, yeah, there's a fair amount that needs to... Uh, some, but mostly they are just, it's sort of like a... They're, they're really there for it. They're really there for it. It's sort of like an early Kitchen Confidential about the restaurant industry. Yeah. And then there's Chapter 22, which is really a socialist um, like a, it's manifesto. A little, yeah, it's a little micro-manifesto. Yeah, and it's mm-hmm. very cool, and I wanted to quote it at length, but you know what, we'll save that. Oh, yeah. That sounds good. And then let me just see. Was there something else that I really 
was dedicated to mentioning. Nah, I think that's it. Okay. We roll into our, our uh... yeah, roll into our our book. Introduce our, my, our am I book. reading or, or am I just introducing? What do you want to read? No, I'll read. Are you up for it? Yeah. Okay. You can probably, my eyes are bothering me today. I've been doing too much reading. So. Sure. So this is um, Mistaken Identity by Assad Hader. Yeah. Um, H-A-I-D-E-R, not a hater, but, <laughs> but hater. Oh, when I first read his name, I thought, was he really trying to make a comment about Assad? Like, or what? In Syria? No, uh, but that's his name. That's his name. It's actually a common name. Yes. Um, so this, um, I, I've, Actually, I only read the last chapter because I was previewed. I was given a, mm-hmm. a heads up that it takes a little while to get into it. I have read the pieces. first three and a half chapters. And it's and, six chapters. And had a hard time. It's a short book. Mm-hmm. And I've had a hard time figuring out really what parts I would highlight and discuss um, because it does take time to, to build a thesis. And honestly, right. I, I thought, you know what? We should just read it backwards. Yeah, and start I, with the last chapter. And I think maybe we should do the same for that other, uh, for that other book we were working on with Chris. Oh, the um, family one. The family, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, you're right. Cause, because uh, unless the the writer really makes a heroic effort to go back and read their and edit ruthlessly their argument, but edit, edit and, then, ruthlessly. and then write yeah, and then write in introductions after they're done. After they're done, right? That really does the job of introducing and then, I have, then you don't just want to read the first chapter no you don't and i have to say this is a uh endemic problem that academics have yeah it is that they don't um assert don't, their thesis first this was something that was so you kind of wander into, in the woods yeah it was know. drummed into my head over and over again uh, yeah. in my writing classes you know, be aware of your audience. Think about your audience. Think, Think about, about who their... your audience is and what they're experiencing when they read your text. And, right. And, yeah, a lot of academics are writing for... They're really doing, honestly, their book, much of it can wind up being what I would even call pre-writing. Pre-writing, yes. You know, it's a not the finished the text. It's their. Right. It's your notes. It's their really exhaustive, fairly readable notes. Yes, so that a lay person could actually read through their notes and come up with a thesis right. at the end. Right. But it's it's very frustrating if you're like, so I'm a hundred pages in. What's this What's book the about thesis? again? Yeah. Like, yeah. what is this book about? Yeah. I'm a hundred. You know, here I am, and I'm still trying to right. figure out what you're saying because I don't know if I agree. Maybe I, I don't know what I think yet. Right. Um. So that's that's very that's challenging. So we started with the sixth chapter. Yeah. Paul read it to me, and it was really good. And I think we pretty much decided we wanted to just kind of, as part of our review, read it, read it, read a lot of this chapter for you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very good. And we'll we'll stop and interject. Yeah. So I'm going to start at the top. Um, that you, that's what you're thinking. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I wanted okay to pick as you know as as much of it. Like if if parts of it are less compelling to actually read on. Mike, skip ahead. Oh, you sure. Know. Okay. But we highlighted some parts that I thought really were compelling. Right. Um, and I do like this particular author's sense of story. Yeah. Um, yeah. As Ronald Reagan was ushering in the era of neoliberalism, my parents immigrated to the United States from Karachi, Pakistan, hoping to pursue academic careers in an environment of intellectual freedom and material abundance. They settled in the middle of rural Pennsylvania where there were no mangoes in the supermarket. (laughs) In a large crowd of demonstrators at San Francisco International Airport in January 2017, I imagined their arrival. As you would expect at an airport, the crowd was diverse, a global array of nationalities, ages, and dispositions. But in the place of exhaustion and anxiety, this crowd displayed energy and outrage. They shouted loudly against the, quote, Muslim ban announced by Donald Trump in his first weeks in office, that refugees are welcome here. By sheer numbers, they managed to shut down all departing flights. Seeing a young boy there who had fashioned a sign for himself reading, Son of a Refugee, I thought of how much my own life had been shaped by the flight that brought my parents to this country. 
I was reminded of everything the Muslim ban threatened to tear apart, not just families, but the lives and dreams of those who have traveled across an ocean in search of a new life. Many desires spur immigrants to travel, but they are united by what Sandro Mezadra calls the right to escape, to escape from poverty and persecution, to discover new geographies and to speak in new languages. The desire of the immigrant is a world with no borders, a world with no detention, a world in which humans move freely and welcome every stranger. It is the recognition that it is possible to think, speak, and live otherwise. And I'm going to have to pause there for just a moment. Sure. I, I think, I, I'm thinking Assad, uh, Hader, is a, is a Marxist? Yes. Okay. And... um and all the attendant things that go with that sort of a no borders thing, et cetera. Well, he talks uh, in his other chapters, he talks a lot about the history of uh, American radical thinkers too, including people like um, Huey Newton. Yeah. Yeah. Huey Newton. Yeah. Yeah. Who has a PhD by the way? And people are like, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, so, and so, them, you know. <laughs> yeah. And the black Panthers and, and right. Yeah, but I mean, he, he covers quite a lot of ground actually. Yeah, uh, because it, it's also it's I mean, a lot his of whole for 114 pages. Yeah, because his whole thesis is also addressing what you know the Combahee River Collective th- thing. Right, where people that's... frequently point back, and this is something I think I have to interject at this point because we're going to get to it in a little bit. Mm-hmm. People often in the conversation about identity politics, because that's the name of his book is Mistaken Identity. Yes, it's he's talking about identity politics. Yes, so people often point back to the Combahatchee River Collective. Sorry, Combahatchee. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correctly. I don't know. Yeah. I, may, I may be mispronouncing it, pardon me. Um, I may have mispronounced it, I'm not sure. And um, as in, that's where we started with this. Mm-hmm. That that's yeah. the seed of what we're asserting now in identity politics, in breaking the glass ceiling, or whatever it is we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Whatever particular cause you're whatever tying to thing, an identity. Right. You're whatever flag you're waving. And um it, it's and it's funny, I'll get to that part in a bit, but uh that's not really where they were going with it. No. No. Right? They just weren't no. going there with it. Um but that's where people keep jumping on as their starting point as the seed of what they're doing. Yeah. Now continuing. Perhaps precisely for this reason. The immigrant represents a core problem for political thought. Not a new one engineered by Trump and his associates, but one as old as the nation-state itself. The fundamental contradiction of the nation-state, as Etienne Balibar has pointed out, is the confrontation and reciprocal interaction between two ways of defining the, quote, people. First, ethnos, quote, an imagined community of membership and filiation. Second, demos, quote, the collective subject of representation, decision-making, and rights. Those are two different things. Mm -hmm. The first sense of the people internalizes the national border. It is the wall Trump hopes to build inside our heads. It is a feeling of belonging to a fictive ethnicity. So this is important. We're not talking about actual traditional ethnic societies and whatnot. We're talking about the abuse of that concept of ethnicity. By the nation state. By the nation state in order right. to create nationalism. Right. Yeah. Because there is a thing that exists where people have... Ethnicities. Ethnicity and relationship to each other. Yes. And those groups have established norms about how to integrate yeah. individuals into the group. Right. And in the case of America, though, our ethnic identity or whatnot as Americans, is ridiculously young and immature. Well, it's you know? young and, and frankly absurd. And abs- because of that, it, it has so little it, actual past to past it. Past or, or meaning or holi- me- meaning, you know, holistic connection. Coherence, so. right. Right. Um, Sorry. Um, just... Oh, it is a feeling of belonging to a fictive ethnicity, an imagined community that is constituted constituted by national borders, but in reality, yeah. consist of heterogeneous populations brought together by migration and movement, right. a plurality suppressed by the fantasy of a unitary racial and spiritual 
essence. Yeah. The second sense of, quote, the people is the political one. Well, the, the, this, this essence mm-hmm. is in America and many other countries now in the present time in our history defined more by who it excludes than who it includes, who it includes. and Ex- what it includes. It's right. the fact of the exclusiveness. The, Precisely. Sorry, the second one. It, uh, the there's de- a political the one. Yeah. The political one. The one that appears to be manifested in our Bill of Rights. It is mm-hmm. meant to apply regardless of identity. It is the song of the Statue of Liberty, which offers its freedoms to all the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, indifferent to their particulars. Mm-hmm. The contradiction between these two notions is the original sin of the American nation state. It is stated in the first sentence of its first official document. We, the people, says the preamble of the Constitution, written by slave owners. Mm-hmm. As Balabar puts it, quoting Balabar, this construction also closely associates the democratic universality of human rights with particular national belonging. This is why the democratic composition of people in the form of the nation led inevitably to systems of exclusion, mm-hmm. the divide between majorities and minorities, and more profoundly still between populations considered native and those considered foreign, heterogeneous, who are racially or culturally stigmatized. Yeah, and in America, the idea of just because of our young and peculiar history, right? you know, considering, like for modern people, who aren't actually part of the First Nations to to be right. thinking of themselves as uh, as natives is a little like, laughable. Like right? what? What does that even mean? And right. offensive to First Nations people. Well, offensive to First Nations and offensive to any kind of coherent yeah anything. And just as an aside, yeah, my uh, ancestors came here legally, legally because they didn't have close any border, or close borders. <laughs> or borders the time. Or, uh, you just showed up. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and just as an aside, as a total tangent, this conversation is happening in the conservative community as well, mm-hmm. where we're looking at the United States and saying, so what the hell does it mean to be a conservative here? What are we conserving? Yeah, what what history and what, what it, identities? Like, what, yeah. is, what is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so who even are we? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, so it, it's, it's a really good question. And uh, just to be clear, We've, as a community of conservatives, the folks that I would consider conservative, mm-hmm. we haven't answered it yet. Yeah, but a lot of the you know outside the people who I don't think you particularly run with the crowd, you know, a lot of oh, the yeah. conservatives basically say, "Well, we're going to adopt this blinkered specific view of um, the constitution, ethno, no ethno Euro nationalism." Oh, yeah. From as as uh, adopted by a few famous thinkers like the. The guy that published the five foot shelf of books, the Harvard Classics, and also oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy that put together the great ideas. The, um, yeah. it turns out, so what's the, what was that guy's name? The great ideas. Uh, oh gosh, I, I'm blanking on it. I can like see his Adler. Adler, yeah, yeah, Warner J. Adler. Yeah, it turned out he was really kind of a had a pretty narrow view of what was constitutive of uh, greatness as far as his ideas. You think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Not that a lot of the stuff he promoted wasn't worth reading oh, and no, good. Oh, no, no. But I, it was defined more by what it excluded than what it included. What it included. And, and, and he was so specific that, like, the uh, the Britannica Great Ideas program would boil things down to, like, here's a single volume that contains the 130 greatest ideas that, you that humans know. have ever had. And uh, this Ding. is what you need to know. Like, come on. You don't say. Yeah. Now, I would assert that there probably are a thousand things that human beings have thought that we should be sure future generations know. Uh, yeah, sure. And, right? and And if you understand and know the basics of these traditions... And You'll have a pretty thinking. broad ground. Yes, yes. A, a broadly grounded education. So I, I, don't, I don't mean to throw out the notion no. of a canon or the notion of this, you know, no. you really need to carry these ideas forward. No. I, I don't mean to dismiss that, but, but just can- that some of the folks who have been writing the canon had yes. a very narrow idea narrow idea of where to draw the ideas from. Yeah. And, and Which this, impoverishes and they us all. Wanna, and, and just be clear. I, it's not appropriate 
to freeze the cannon clamp, you know, weld it shut at some point, arbitrary no. point, and say, you know, ne plus ultra, right? <laughs> no, I, I don't think it's the Bible. There will never be anything else to add, uh, you know, anything from any other country or culture we haven't considered. Those folks aren't. But you, yeah. but you see, I'm not, I'm not accusing you of this, but you do see this a lot in, uh, in oh, yeah. conservative thinking. Mm-hmm. And I, I really get fed up with it. Sure. Well, and, and of course you would, right? Because um, you get the folks who had the canon from 1901, and now it's 2018, mm-hmm. and there's new information. Yes. And, and, and another aspect of it, so like the Harvard books and whatnot. Sure. The idea that um any anyone who could read mm-hmm. basically could order this set of books mm-hmm. and get something valuable out of like the original text by like Lavoisier say you know mm-hmm. is is slightly laughable with, without without a class without a teacher without a guide without a translator without Whatever, all, reading all these scholars, you know, Seneca, all these scholars and yeah. whatnot in the, their original with no interpreter. Yeah, it's like sola scriptura. It's it's completely sola scriptura. But here's <clears throat> the rub. Okay, this is this is going to be the end of the, the digression. Okay, I'm sorry. We're going to stop I'm, it here. I'm kind of bad about he, the digression. Here's the rub with that, right? Yeah, yeah. The whole point is, so you know, the information can. It's like the free classes from Harvard. The information is free. Anyone can have it because can, it's not about the information. Yeah, you can. I can take one of MIT's really advanced calculus classes for, for free. I can download the yeah the the exercises and the lectures online, and I can beat my head against that. And I am perfectly free to Go fail utterly to understand any of it. Yes, and that and that's sort of the the lie of it yeah. is yeah. this claim that. They're giving that away because that's not what's valuable. Right. That's why they're giving that away. Right. And then they can pretend that that information is freely available. Education is now egalitarian. But even worse than that, right? This is and this is the egalitarian lie. Mm-hmm. Well, you had access to the same thing these people had access right. to, and you couldn't do anything right. with it. No, that's because not the lie is yeah. that it's the information that's valuable, right. not the learning experience and the learning process and the community of learning. And it's not to say that there aren't some really brilliant uh, autodidacts out there. I, the I, world is full of them. I have often, in many subjects, been an autodidact. Yes. You know, but it also means that my education in different areas tends to be ec- extremely eclectic, eclectic, as you might say. Has not, not spotty, but gaping, like... Gaping chasms, yeah. uh, in a, yeah. chasms here, mountains there, right? And no and, correlation. And I probably have a lot them. of misapprehensions about things I've only read about, you know, from one text. Just right? enough information to be dangerous. Yeah. Okay, back. Okay. Sorry. To the point. Sorry. Moving Assad on. Hider. <laughs> this democratic contradiction came clearly to the surface in the French Revolution, with its declaration of the rights of man and citizen. In 1843, a young Karl Marx subjected this declaration to critical scrutiny. In, quote, On the Jewish Question, Marx was responding first and foremost to Bruner Bauer's critique of the demand for Jewish emancipation. According to Bauer, any identity, religious or otherwise, was necessarily exclusionary and therefore incompatible with universal emancipation. Demanding the emancipation of the particular identity of the Jew, Bauer argued, reproduced this exclusion, which had been taken to its extreme by the Christian state. Political emancipation would necessarily be universal and would thus require a kind of disidentification. But Marx pointed out that secular political emancipation, the separation of church and state in the name of universal rights, had not actually overcome religious superstition in practice. Famously and prophetically, he cited, he cited the United States as an example. This was because rights were granted to individuals, Marx argued, and were therefore the rights of egoistic man, of men separated from other men and from the community. 
Mm-hmm. Protecting the individual's rights in the political sphere did not mean the end of oppression by religious authorities and the owners of property. Therefore, neither Bauer's abstract and aristocratic universalism nor the particularism of a minority could lead to real human emancipation. This would involve going beyond political emancipation and overcoming the exploitation of the market. In an essay on Marx's relevance for the analysis of contemporary identity politics, Wendy Brown summarizes his complex argument. Here, Wendy Brown summarizes. Historically, rights emerged in modernity, both as a vehicle of emancipation from political disenfranchisement or institutionalized servitude and as a means of privileging an emerging bourgeois class within a discourse of formal egalitarianism and universal citizenship. Thus, they emerged both as a means of protection against arbitrary use and abuse by sovereign and social power, and as a mode of securing and naturalizing dominant social powers. Back to the text. This implies a paradox for liberalism that persists to this day. When rights are granted to, quote, empty abstract individuals, just the, a blank. An, an individual. Just, an in individual and abstract. Yeah. Right? So like in these sci-fi movies where they have like these blank clones that they put a person into, right? <laughs> well, I'm reminded of um, when you're talking about managed care, the rhetoric of managed care yeah, involves yeah. basically buying and selling lives, lives. that the company is going to be responsible for, for fiscally, lives. right? right. Li- just lives. Just, yeah, any old life. Um, they ignore the real social forms of inequality and depression that appear to be outside the political sphere. Yet when the particularities of injured identities are brought into the content of rights, Brown points out, they are, quote, more likely to become sites of the production and regulation of identity as injury than vehicles of emancipation. In other words, when the liberal language of rights is used to defend a concrete identity group from injury, physical or verbal, that group ends up defined by its victimhood. Yes. And individuals yes. end up reduced to their victimized belonging. Yes. I mean, and you see that in like the very specific language used in the United States of protected classes. Well, in right. the legal framework, sure. In the legal framework, right. But it's also, I mean, you say in the, in the broader culture too, you talk about the uh, um, victim Olympics. Oh yeah, no, I, I was called the the, oppre- the uh, oppression Olympics. The oppression Olympics, like so, yeah. I'm more oppressed than you are. That's yeah. not the same, you know. And and you you see this? I mean, intersectionality isn't supposed to do this. No. But you see people like with multiple um, oppressed identities, almost like piling them on and saying, "Hey, like, let me stack up my." Uh, intersection or intersecting oppressed identities and look I've got more than you and I don't think that's what anybody means yeah. but that's what people do yeah and, and it's, that's what happens it's just and, as dumb as as was it James Watts comment about how we've got you know th- two Jews a cripple a black or something on right. this committee I forget who it right, was but right. his famous statement is like oh well surely no one could complain it if you've got two this. Jews and a cripple, a cripple a, a black guy <laughs> I think we're there. Right. Well, a black woman, just to cover all the bases. Yeah, right. okay. Um, so this is how it ends up in practice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and like like she pointed out, these really don't have, these aggrieved identities don't have all that, necessarily have much to do with the, the actual policy. Policy, Unless right. you happen to be in a protected class. or right. And by definition... Uh, a protected class excludes people who aren't in the protected class. Right. Brown shows how this logic undermines the logic behind an influential, albeit controversial, strand of feminism. Catherine McKinnon's attempt to redress the masculine bias of the law. McKinnon's anti-pornography feminism was based on the premise that the right to free speech conflicted with the right of women to be free from sexual subordination. I'm I'm an anti-porn feminist, just to be clear, mm-hmm. and um, and I don't think I base that in rights. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I, 
I base it in morality when I was rather than rice. In the nineties, I was really into reading McKinnon and Dworkin and, and all this rhetoric and books arguing both sides of the porn debate because this was a thing mm-hmm. at the time. And I was very much a First Amendment absolutist in yeah. that. I really wanted to own and acquire basically any book that had been banned. And so I oh, found myself yeah. very much opposed to this idea that you would fight um, uh, oppression by by getting someone's you know, someone's um, work banned work banned. Mm-hmm. And I'm not these days I'm maybe not quite such a first amendment absolutist. Not that I, I wasn't strictly, I mean, anything that was you can't actually yell fire in a theater. Yeah. Right. Like you know, things that were literally, you know, criminal to produce child pornography or whatnot. Of right. course I didn't support that, but, right, but uh, I, I don't support porn. Yeah. Full stop because it's immoral Yes, and it can't be produced morally. Yes. It can't be morally produced. Um, I think the only thing you could morally produce is possibly an edu- you know, like an educational video, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Um, but we're not going to try and define pornography and erotica, but... Um, especially but, not at the, at the but, moment. But right? this was a thing. This was a big debate in the 90s about um, strategy and tactics to fight uh, right. oppression, misogyny, sexism, and all, using the force of law to get books banned and, and to getting... They couldn't right. get laws changed in the United States, so they served. They they, they, uh, they started doing it in Canada. They yeah worked out strategy to get to get the structure of obscenity law changed in Canada. Right. So um, so the premise was the right to free speech conflicted with the right of women to be free from sexual subordination. But as Brown asks, does a definition of women as sexual subordination <clears throat> and the encoding of this definition in law? work to liberate women from sexual ex- subordination or does it paradoxically reinscribe femaleness as sexual violability basically reifies their um their victim identity right and yeah. that's a good question yeah i think right? it is brown's critique suggests that when rights are demanded by a particular identity group and the whole horizon of politics is the defense of this category. Its members end up fixed as victims. Rights themselves end up reduced to a reaction to an injury inflicted mm-hmm. on this victim. They're emancipated. Yeah, they're, not, to, they're not affirmative rights. They're not affirmative. So, yeah. they're, they're negative rights. They're rather than positive rights. Yeah, right to be protected from this and this and this. Right. And, um, the, their emancipatory content disappears. So by presenting a legal argument that tries... They're emancipatory content, so they're no longer they're well, enumerating a there. freedom. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, tries to, so, so by presenting a legal argument that tries to give rights a substantial content, the content of particular identities, McKinnon ends up producing a fixed and passive category of, quote, woman. The possibility of women organizing themselves against sexual oppression, the kind of organization that implies self-directed mass action ends up neutralized by a legal discourse. So it's like, um, yeah, all, all the air is taken out of it. And and Mm -hmm. there's, there's an example that occurs to me and I know I always upset people when I tell them, Mm -hmm. but this is the core of my argument about um, hate crimes legislation. Yes. That number one, it is effectively a thought crime. You you have created a category of crime that's, that's where the action itself is no different than what is covered by existing law. Right. But you've added a, a category that's a, a level of um, like. But you were you thought because you pros- thought this. prosecution available to you. Because, yeah, because you're basing it on your reaction to someone's identity. Right. Or what, what you... What you perceive to be their what identity. What you perceive to be their identity yeah. and what yeah. you think about that perceived identity. Yeah. So now, I mean, it's always going to be illegal, well, I hope it is, to, to, for you to go into a church and murder yeah, a bunch of people. Yeah, burn down a church. Or, burn down a or, church. Or, or, or beat someone up on the street. street. That's a crime. Yeah. That's already crime. And the actual problem we have is not that we aren't prosecuting people 
for beating up gay men, mm-hmm. or that we aren't. Oh, oh, pardon me. The prop. The problem is that isn't that it's legal to go beat up gay men. Yeah. The problem is yeah. that it's legal to burn down a church. Right. The problem is that we don't have the political will to prosecute someone for beating up a gay man. We will write that off. It's just a couple of guys having a brawl. You know, and there's no reason to press charges against anybody. Or, yeah, they are just some, just a couple of students. Just a couple you know, of students, you know. You don't want to ruin their lives. Yeah, I mean, come on. Uh, we, will, we won't prosecute someone for burning a cross or burning down a church. Because, you know, how do we know it was arson? There were good people on both sides. There were good people, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard <laughs> Char- to... It's, Charlottesville. It's, it's hard to know, you know? I mean, it's yeah, right. this sort of equivocation right. where right. someone commits a crime and we as a society make a decision not to prosecute them. Mm-hmm. That's the problem we have. Mm-hmm. Not that that crime doesn't, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Yeah, or there's not already a category for it. Right. Whereas when we create legal a category rem- of remedy. of hate crime, we create, we create a category of thought crime. Now, this is some very dangerous and Orwellian territory. I, because remember, the problem we have yeah. is that we're not prosecuting crimes. Not that there aren't crimes. I, I'm almost there with you. But I, I, well, I just you see be, that? being of, you know, like my own sort of history of uh, struggling against, you know, against um, bullying. You know, right. I, it's hard to feel like the bullying itself wasn't a thing. It was a thing. The bullying and the thought process behind it was a thing. The problem Certainly. is you can't use the law to tell people how to think so right you can't yes you just and that can't. doesn't fix and it. as stokely carmichael has said if a man wants to lynch me that's really his problem mm-hmm. that's his problem mm-hmm. now if he is free to lynch me yeah that's my, that's problem. my problem and well, that's what i need to do that was about. my whole you know grade school and high school experiences there were plenty of people who were free to, to pummel me. Free to attack you. Yeah. And that's to bully me. Right. The fact that they wanted to is neither here nor there. Yeah. The fact that they could yeah. without any you know, recrimination, and, and then, that's the problem. And the number one thing that they said mm-hmm. when they were pummeling me mm-hmm. was was to, to give me an identity that I, that I don't even have, I don't even claim. Oh, right, right. Which was that I was a faggot, you know, that I you was gay. gay. Because right. I wasn't living up to their their masculine standard ideal or some kind. of whatever. Right. So they didn't like sports ball, you know. They didn't like whatever. sports ball. Come on, sports ball though. <laughs> yeah. And the but, um, yeah, and so they were giving me in their heads. They were giving me an identity that I don't, I don't even claim or don't even have. Right. Not that you know. Not that I. <laughs> anyway. Right. But uh, and acting on it. And acting you know, on right. that, right? And so, you know, I was the one going home with the, the busted lip and the black eyes and all Et cetera. That. And what we see now... That's just good is, fun, though. We'd oh, come on. Just boys lives. being boys, you yeah. know? And that's the problem. Not that we need some bullying legislation and, yeah. like, how is it appropriate for children to do that to each other? I mean, let's just take a moment to talk talk about that, right? Well, really, it was my own fault because I didn't yeah. su- I didn't successfully fight back hard. Like fight enough. back, you know, because it's that's how we do. If things. I had just killed one of them, it would have stopped. Would have stopped, right? Yeah, yeah. Except then, then they have to press charges because you know you don't kill people. <sighs> but what we actually see with hate crimes legislation, we Ender's see game. these situations <laughs> where um, apparently a guy was charged with hate with a hate crime. For calling the police that arrested him uh, Nazis, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. in this jurisdiction the police were a protected class. Okay, that's weird. Okay, so this is what I mean by the frame of hate crime. It's a very short. I should just say it's a very short leap from there to you. You can't call for the abolition of ICE. Right. Right. You'll right. be locked up because. Those people are are protected. Are a protected under class. Law. It's a very short line to yeah. completely Orwellian law. Yeah, and it will yeah. only ever be used against the people who quote need it the most. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, when in fact, all those people ever needed was for you to, ex- you know, uh, prosecute existing, the existing law, law, enforce existing law. Long tangent. Sorry, um, that's our specialty here. <laughs> this is precisely the problem which comes to the forefront in the contemporary quote Muslim question. Um, Written oh, this by is a Muslim, by the way. Written by a Muslim. Uh, um, they're, they're talking about hijab here, and I'm going to skip a 
bit of this because I just gave a long thing to illustrate what mm-hmm. we're just talking about. Um, as Elaine Badio points out in his book Ethics, this liberal paradigm of rights in the defense of victims is a foundation of imperialism, of so called, quote, humanitarian intervention. It is the bedrock of humanitarian intervention. Well, their rights are being violated. Mm-hmm. And it goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. It goes both ways. So we didn't invade, uh, we didn't do anything in Rwanda, right? Mm, we wouldn't no. even cut off the radio. Because no. you know, they have a right to free speech. We can't cut off their right. radio. Oh, well, they're using the radio to organize massacres. Right, they're giving out people's names yeah. and addresses yeah. over the radio. Uh, the and like, can you at least shut that right. down? No, nope, that right. would be a violation of their free, free speech. speech rights. So um, it cuts any way you need it to cut. Mm-hmm. The civilizing mission of imperialism, the, quote, white man's burden, claims to defend the mere physical existence of the people. People are reduced to animals, excluded from politics, because they are unable to act politically on their own. They require the protection of a state. Yep. See, I'm with them all the way right there. Because, yeah. you know, yeah. the state can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> as an anarchist. <laughs> right, so. I resemble this remark. I resemble this remark. Who cannot see, Batty, you asked, that this ethics which rests on the misery of the world hides behind its victim man, the good man, the white man. An intervention conducted in the name of a civilization requires an initial contempt for the situation as a whole, including its victims. Today's self congratulatory foundation. <coughs> <coughs> oh, I got a little tickle. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Today's self congratulatory discourse of moral responsibility and the ethics of military intervention coming back you points out after decades of courageous critiques of colonialism and imperialism by the people who did it <laughs> amounts to little more than a sordid self satisfaction in the West. Quote mm. West, such as mm. it is. With the insistent argument according to which the misery of the third world has the result of its own incompetence, its own inanity, in short, its subhumanity. They just need, a, uh, they just need to um, turn these people into competent businessmen and capitalism I mean, really. will lift them all out of poverty. All right. Rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, how about some microloans? That would help. That would go a long way. Yeah, especially... Uh, yeah, every every uh, poor woman needs birth control, and she needs a microloan to start her own small business. Yeah, that should go a long way. But you know, she'll she'll have to buy the birth control after the first month, just yeah, so you know. Yeah, like the baby formula. Yeah, is it possible to go beyond the liberal paradigm of victimhood and the paradox of rights? We have a strong historical basis for doing so. If we understand this paradox as the expression of a concrete political antagonism, as Massimiliano Tomba does in his comparison of the two versions of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. This is pretty fascinating, I have to say. Yeah, it really is. This first declaration of uh, 1789, Tomba argues, grounds rights in a juridical universalism. Juridical as in juris, um, based in law, based in in the courts. Yeah. The universalism that comes from above and that implies a subject of right who is either passive or a victim who requires protection. Whether it is a woman to be protected from pornographic speech or a Muslim to be protected from religious prejudice, juridical universalism grants no agency to these subjects. Their only political existence is mediated by their protection from the state. Because of their identities. Because of their identities. Their right. protected classes. Right. Their Excuse specific me. victimhood. Excuse me. The 1793 Declaration, in contrast, manifests an insurgent universality. One brought on to the historical stage by the slave uprisings of the Haitian Revolution, which, you know, you know if there's anything that I think all people should read about mm-hmm. and should know about, going forward Mm -hmm. it's the haitian revolution this is the one case in history where the enslaved people actually broke their chains broke their chains yeah killed their slave owners yeah and sent and sent their masters packing packing. right everyone should read that just like you know it's kind of like the the the, uh the passover story you should just read that Mm -hmm. it's important Mm -hmm. to know um 
the intervention of women into the political process that had excluded them and the demands of the sans culotte for a right to food and life, it does not presuppose any abstract bearer of rights, Tomba writes, but instead refers to particular and concrete individuals, women, the poor, and slaves, and their political and social agency. Here we encounter a new paradox. The universality of these particular and concrete individuals acting in their specific situation is more universal than the juridical universalism of the abstract bearers of rights. So these things only have meaning in context. Yes. Outside of context, it's just, you know, air. A citizen right, yeah. of some, some, some abstract rare, place. Rarefied right. place bearing some rarefied right in some rarefied context. Right. Yeah. A case in point, in 1799, the Haitian revolutionary leader Toussaint Louverture was asked by France to write on the banners of his army, brave blacks, remember that the French people alone recognize your liberty and the equality of your rights. He refused. <laughs> Pointing to the slavery that persisted in France's other colonies, yes. and replied in a letter to Bonaparte, it is not a liberty of circumstance conceded to us alone that we want. It is the absolute adoption of the principle that no man, born red, black, or white, can be the property of his fellow. It is still possible to claim the legacy of this insurgent universality, which says that we are not passive victims, but active agents of a politics that demands freedom for everyone. It was for this reason that I was struck by the beauty of the crowd at the San Francisco airport. The decision of so many with no personal stake to defend the rights of every immigrant. Those who had nothing to lose but their own comfort and security were there alongside the children of refugees, shouting just as loudly. They brought into being what Badiou calls an egalitarian maxim proper to any politics of emancipation. It is a maxim that calls unconditionally for the freedom of those who are not like us. And as any immigrant knows, everyone is not like us. We yeah, are not even yeah. like ourselves. Yeah, this was a I thought a great point. Right. Um, and I, I and the tangent at this moment is that I keep saying that I think um, Chris Travers, my friend Chris Travers, mm -hmm. has just about convinced me. I'm not there yet, but just about convinced me to abandon the rights framework altogether because I don't, you know, I don't really embrace the Enlightenment to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have this this sort of thing <laughs> because it is it's the rights framework that i assert when i say that unborn children have a right to life mm -hmm. so i'm just i don't well, know you're, in that case are you, are you arguing from their identity i'm arguing from their humanity right that they're human beings you don't right. have a right to kill them right that that's my point. So I, so I don't know. I, I don't know. But I, I but I, I, I'm specifically putting you on notice, Chris. I'm going to call you because I want to talk with this, talk with you about this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. I love it when um. Uh, this happens to me a lot recently reading political books. Yeah. I love it when they start having arguments in my head. <laughs> on, with each other yes the books i've read in the past and the books i'm reading currently they start bickering and and pointing to, to each other's passages and quoting each other and like getting in debates you know and, oh gosh well i have one friend who does a lot of political reading yeah. and like every new book he reads he has a new thing and yeah. sometimes the new yeah. thing displaces something displaces else? something else or is there a contradiction of what it, or is a direct contradiction yeah, yeah. of what he was saying i don't know nine months ago right 18 months ago no it's He's, it's and then i feel like all i all i feel like my there's actually like a a pot boiling over in my brain and you know i've got a uh, i've got a you know yeah, talk well, about it <laughs> and that's that's a little bit of the situation right where if you're right. if you're really willing to interrogate your own beliefs yeah yeah down to the well, foundations of the beliefs. Um, you're you're going to have some pushback. You're going to have some conflict. Internally. That's how it works. Externally and internally. And, But also, I think the important thing to realize is that is how you grow and develop. Yeah. Uh, it's the unexamined life versus the uh, examined life. Right. Um, which takes you someplace new. And uh, 
produces something of benefit to all of us. Yeah. Um, moving on. Today, it is customary to adopt the language that calls groups designated as foreign or alien, quote, the other. The other. A relation Othering someone. that is said to enact a reductive de degradation. But as Batty points out in ethics, the other is already everywhere, even in you. It seems like we should track down this uh, this ethics this ethics book. Yeah. I, yeah, it seems important. Infinite alterity is quite simply what there is. Any experience at all, and I'm quoting from Betty you here, mm -hmm. is the infinite deployment of infinite differences. Even the apparently reflexive experience of myself is by no means the intuition of a unity, but a labyrinth of differentiations. And Rimbaud was certainly not wrong when he said, I am another. There are as many differences, say, between a Chinese peasant and a young Norwegian professional as between myself and anybody at all, including myself. <laughs> the, this idea of diversity and all that, I, I was commenting earlier. Oh, that, yeah. Um, that one of the ideals of, of Star Trek and, you know, the uh, Gene Roddenberry's creation, his... Um, his Starfleet was a, a principle called IDIC, infinite diversity in infinite it's combinations. combinations. And the idea was, it was pretty radical at the time, was if we're going to explore the universe, we're going to discover infinite diversity in infinite combination. We need to embrace it, you know, right. as, a, as, a, as a good, not a thing to be, you know, we come in peace, shoot to kill. <laughs> or, <laughs> da -da. Or, or you, oh, they're, these aliens are different than we are. They're mm -hmm. unchristian. We're gonna have to. Uh, gonna have to Christianize them. Yeah. Uh, or you know, sometimes you have to destroy a planet in order to save in order it. To save it. You know, it's all you could do. <laughs> no, we're gonna embrace it because right. we believe in ideas. What was Obama supposed to do? They were undocumented miners. He had to throw them in cages. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right. We should. Um, can we can we come I'm, to I'm an gonna, end of I'm our quoted section? Skip a little section. part. Little I, I want to point out that this chapter is called universality, and I think what it's illustrating here is that um, Hader's whole argument about uh, about um, identity basically comes down to the point of saying obsessing about the identities is le a lesser goal, a, it's a lesser a lesser. Goal. A, a lesser um, tactic a lesser strategy than always getting to the root of absolute and utter solidarity and right solidarity is the goal yeah solidarity is the point that's what you're doing yeah that's what you're doing and i and actually i've got one um one more long passage okay that i think um uh will take us there let me just make sure i can find my end okay of where i want to go okay yeah I, I so yeah there's a there's a bit more but I okay. think it's all. We'll, we'll do it. I'll just be here. Okay, skipping and then continuing. This is fair use under Title Nine. Blah blah blah. It's, it's copyright. And blah blah blah. blah something <laughs> okay. for educational purposes, educational and um, review purposes. Yeah, indeed, those whom liberal thought reduces to passive victims have always been active agents of politics, the source of insurgent universal universality. In the words of C.L.R. James, quote, the struggle of the masses for universality did not begin yesterday. Paul Gilroy's groundbreaking book, The Black Atlantic, shows that black radical intellectuals have adopted the heritage of the Enlightenment, as was foreshadowed in the Haitian Revolution, came to articulate, quote, a counterculture of modernity. This was precisely an example of a foundational alterity that is summed up in the word diaspora, and bridges between the African and Jewish experiences. Diaspora, Gilroy argues, disrupts the idea of cultural nationalism and the over-integrated conceptions of culture which present immutable ethnic differences as an absolute break in the histories and experiences of, quote, black and, quote, white people. It forces us to confront a far more difficult and complicated reality, reality. quote, creolization, Metisage, metisades, uh, and hybrid hybridity. Quote more than a quote litany. Me, creating uh, like mestizos and. Um, oh, just, just to unpack that a little bit. Yeah. In the Louisiana Bayou, we have Creoles. Yes. Um. In, in throughout South America, there there's metisage and metis metisage, 
And all these things are talking about populations of people Mm -hmm. who are hybrids of several different blended 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 together but they have uh, um, maybe an oppression and maybe an identity because of their it's it's like being a uh, what would have been a quadroon or an octoroon or something like something like that right but because they are part of this mixed heritage they are something new something new and yet share a a history yes of, of oppression a history of oppression but more with each other than with just like all of their, their mm-hmm. identity is mm-hmm. not the same as an right. African who stayed in Africa. Right, you're you're splitting right. splitting hairs. Of, now you're about splitting hairs. Identity. Here. Right, which from the viewpoint of ethnic absolutism are little more than a litany of pollution and impurity. Yes. But, so if you're if you believe in nationalism, if you, if you believe, believe in, in ethnic that. nationalism, then well, this group isn't. Their they're identity, not really. They don't have Africans. enough of identity because they're some right. tainted mix. And of, if you want to take it all the way, yeah. so who? Who gets to claim Who's the term? Left? <laughs> no, who gets to claim the term African American? Right. If is that is Elon Musk an African American? <laughs> yes, technically, without uh, the hyphen. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Um, I'm just asking. You know. Yeah, All right. Yeah. So, uh, um, but such an ethnic absolutism, Gilroy, par- powerfully shows, obscures the rich cultural legacies that emerge from processes of cultural mutation and restless discontinuity mm-hmm. that exceed racial mm-hmm. discourse and avoid, cap- avoid capture by its agents. So um, the entire black diaspora, the entire yeah. Jewish diaspora, has a shared meaning. Mm-hmm. But these individual identities yeah. only make that shared meaning greater. And I think that right? avoiding capture by its agents means not allowing right. someone else to speak for To speak you. for you. Yeah. And say you do belong or you don't belong, right? Right, right. and say, well, you actually, technically, you're less than one fifth this, so you can't claim this right. on the census, right? Right, and get such and such, I don't know, tiddly wink from the government. And this is a yeah, and this is a liberal strategy. Yes, right? when, a, when, yes. When you're talking about say um, acquiring some kind of um, social capital via some kind of Program some precisely, kind of relief precisely. Program. Whereas in, you, right. you you have to you have to tick all the boxes and not tick not not hit any of the asterisks, you right? Know, or and you're then not eligible. and if we find out that if you tick the wrong box, that you you earn some money by by because you donated plasma, you got some cash back and you wow. didn't report it, and now you're now you're a criminal, and now you're a criminal, and now your kids don't get uh, food benefits anymore. Too bad, so sad. Yeah. Oh, um, and that, that's something that, that's 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 tied to the other book that we we've, we've been reading about family, the history of um, yes, uh, and w- means a, testing and so on. Means testing, aid to families with dependent children, and right. all that. Kombaha, I I, I mispronounced this. Kombaha. Kombahi member Demita Fraser has pointed out that this excess beyond identity was at work in the collective's initial proposal of, quote, identity politics. So they had it right way back then. Way, way back then. <laughs> they, were, they weren't they were talking about identities as the be-all and end-all be of, end of your political struggle. Struggle, right. We, quoting, uh, quoting Demita Fraser, we never actually, as far as I can tell, as far as the classic definition really practice what people now call identity politics because the centerpiece and the center focus was not an aspect of our identity, but the totality of what it meant to be a black woman in the diaspora. Continuing, however, not not continuing her, but continuing um, Hader's work. However, embracing the radical counterculture of modernity does not mean an uncritical embrace of the European Enlightenment. Gilderoy criticizes the celebration of European intellectual history as a manifestation of today's conservative complacency, which romanticizes the European past Mm -hmm. and seeks quietly to reinstate the innocent, unreflexive universalisms, liberal, religious, and ethnocentric. The project of insurgent universality is not advanced by purported Marxists who engage in the uncritical and ahistorical celebrations of the Enlightenment an old and tired position. 
We're going to do an old, a whole show on the Enlightenment. We do. Because <laughs> I, I think if any, anyone listening should already know, I, I don't, I don't you just, really. You oppose, you're opposed to the Enlightenment. I reject the Enlightenment. Not that right. it existed, but its assertions. I got a. I used to. This is where Grace and I are like. I'm scratching my head like, who is this person? Who is this woman? Yeah. As, Gilroy points uh, yeah. out that these lazy analyses remain substantially unaffected by the histories of barbarity, which appear to be such a prominent feature of the widening gap between modern experience and modern expectation. Quoting, there is a scant sense, for example, that the universality and rationality of enlightened Europe and America were used to sustain and relocate rather than eradicate an order of racial difference inherited from the pre-modern era. The figure of Columbus does not appear to, to complement the standard pairing of Luther and Copernicus mm -hmm. as implicitly mm -hmm. used to mark the limits of this particular understanding of modernity. Locke's colonial interests and the effect of the conquest of the Americas on Descartes and Rousseau are simply non-issues. In such a reading of modernity, not only are the crimes of enlightened Europe erased, so was the centrality of the Black Atlantic. And remember, early on we were talking about how, um, yes, when you make this all about the, the black identity, then the history of slavery is part of Black History Month and part of that identity, and not, part about, that, and and not, not part of the, identify, the identity of the oppressing, of, the of oppressing Europe, Europe, Europe. countries. Yeah, right. It's not history. part of British identity. It's not right. a part of. This is like a black thing, something they were doing. Well, we're having done. <laughs> we're done somehow. By, yes. Right. Um, in this setting, it is hardly surprising that if it is perceived to be relevant at all, the history of slavery is somehow assigned to blacks. It becomes our special property rather than a part of the ethical and intellectual heritage of the West as a whole. This is only just preferable to the conventional alternative response, which views plantation slavery as a pre-modern residue that disappears once it is revealed to be fundamentally incompatible with enlightened rationality and capitalist industrial production. And yeah, I mentioned this is a, a conservative talking point about right. getting, uh, helping blacks get off the democratic plantation. Right. right? They're moving forward. We're leaving that behind. That's pre-modern. Yeah. Just, uh, you just got to become a small business person. Then. Yeah. There you go. You're on your, you're free. It's not like the regulations would choke you on day one. <laughs> A universal position can only be achieved. Or, or the, the guy in San Francisco who has a, the, the lemonade shop, right? Right. Where the police keep arresting him for trying to open up his own store in the morning. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. That, he just needed a business. Yeah. But the, no, they're, they're constantly watching him. And, and if he calls them a Nazi calling. while he arrests yeah. them, then he's committed the hate crime. <laughs> because of the, they were protected <laughs> identity as uh, Blue Lives Matter. But, you know, but. Anyway, you know, sorry. Anyhow, I'm, 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 we're, like, we're almost there. We're almost, we're almost there. there. Hang on. It's okay. Just, just, just five more minutes, okay? Yeah, yeah. A universal position can only be achieved if we are serious about reckoning, reckoning with colonial modernity. If we draw on the Black Atlantic counterculture to put forth with what Gilroy calls a strategic universalism, that goes beyond Europe. Universality does not exist in the abstract as a prescriptive principle which is mechanically applied to indifferent circumstances. It is created and recreated in the act of insurgency, which does not demand emancipation solely for those who share my identity, but for everyone. It says that no one will be enslaved. It equally refuses to freeze the oppressed in a status of victimhood that requires protection from above. It insists that emancipation is self-emancipation. From the plantation insurrections to the Combahee Kamba River Collective, this is a universality that necessarily confronts and opposes capitalism. Straight up, I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anti-capitalism is. is a necessary <laughs> and indispensable step on this path. As Barbara Smith puts it, invoking a part of the legacy of the Combahee River Collective, which must be revived and protected. The reason the Combahee Blacks, the Combahee's Black feminism, is so powerful, is because it's anti-capitalist. Yes. One would expect Black feminism to be anti-racist and opposed to sexism. Anti-capitalism is what gives it the sharpness, the edge, the thoroughness, 
the revolutionary potential. And I'll end there. And this is, uh, this is just like you said, uh, you were personally not opposed to people using identity politics, but you were opposed to the cynical abuse of identity politics. Right. Because, and that right. watered down use of identities to lock people in, in boxes in a, this juridical framework. In this, this, in this victimhood space. Identitarian, you know, right. oppression Olympics, all this stuff, was, had no power at all to to like 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 um hater said to create to self emancipate self emancipation and to right. support people emancipating themselves Self. right because that's disruptive to capitalism yeah that would be a problem and yeah yeah and i think that's that's the fundamental argument that i have with any identity politics right is that it can't ever be about um Let's get one particular woman through that through that glass, through ceiling. glass ceiling. Let's yeah. get one get one particular woman in a position of power. That was the single most cynical and appalling it's use a, of identity disgusting. politics that I it's have disgusting. ever seen. Was literally Hillary Clinton's glitter. Right. Right. Oh Jesus! The glitter that they had all prepared that was supposed to simulate her smashing glass a glass ceiling. ceiling. As her victory as was if that's supposed to have some value to everyone in the audience, or to or to women in a homeless shelter everyone that night, not in the audience, as if that was supposed to mean something or some value, right. and or that gain it was something. it was going to gain us some kind of wonderful, brave new world, po- uh, positive change in itself, in that itself, act, that and that's and I think that's the thing and that's that, so that dangerous. Victory for her identity. Right, is this idea you can believe that look at all the women in power, look at all the black people that have you know homes, look at this, look More at this, female look at that. ice agents. Woo! <laughs> Blacks can wear their hair any way they want as they kill people. Yeah. In the military. Yes. I mean that's that's what the identity politics that I see functioning means. It doesn't mean we're going to disband the military. It doesn't mean... We're going to we're, stop our imperial wars. Nothing. It doesn't mean we're going to stop our imperial wars. It, it doesn't it, mean any of that. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that the TSA will be trans-friendly as they pat you down and violate right. you in every respect. Right. Right. They'll use your your, your preferred pronouns. You use, they'll use they, your preferred pronouns. As they grope you. As they grope you. <laughs> it doesn't mean they're going to stop groping you. Right. Right. And this, right. I'm going to leave leave this whole conversation with one thing that I think highlights this for me mm-hmm. when I see people trying to use identity politics like this. Okay. Um, a few years back, I actually forget how many. So Arizona had that law that everyone started like freaking out about, where that gave the police sweeping powers to, if they saw someone they suspected was an immigrant, yes, yeah. they could the papers po- please law. They could ask for your papers. Right. The city of Arizona. And like liberals everywhere were, oh my God, that's so racist. <laughs> oh my God. Based on the, the the these people's identity and their victimhood. And their victimhood. Their and specific then, victim. And then identity. conservatives are all like, well, you know, some of these people are dangerous. <laughs> they could be uh, MS-13 members or right? whatever the hell. We, we have no, whatever the civil that we had yeah. at the time. And I was like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the police what? suspect you're an immigrant, that's every fucking one of us. Right. Everyone right. here right. is now subject to search by the police. Right, right. And that's what's wrong. And the conservatives weren't saying, this is a fundamental Don't. constitutional rights issue. And it applies to everyone. It applies to all of us. Yeah. Like somehow everyone missed that because we were focused on identity politics. Yes. The fact that this yeah. violates every... And here's the thing. Well, when and you... Now, and now in America, you know, if you're, uh, half the country is under, is under like half checkpoints. Half the population. Half the lives population lives in a regime where they can stop your bus or your train or whatnot and walk around demanding papers. Demanding papers. And every person with a shred of decency... And uh, ought to be opposed to that. Ought to say, do the Ben Kenobi mind trip? You don't need to see my identification. Sorry. Yeah, and or stand up for the person that they are harassing. They are harassing because they're actually harassing you. It's all of us. 
It's all of us. So to the point that your identity politics don't inform you that you yourself are at risk. And drive you to stand up for these people. Because this is an affront to you. Yes. Right? You don't get the identity politics. In other words, you're not doing it because it's a black guy. Right. You're not doing it because whatever. You're doing this because it's wrong. I mean, I'm not standing against slavery because blacks shouldn't be enslaved. No one should own another person. Right. Right. And I'm not going to carry the banner of the Democratic Party who says, you know, no one should own slaves when Hillary Clinton had slaves slaves. in the governor's mansion. (laughs) Just, you know. And, you know, fought to uh, (laughs) to to enslave uh, Haitians. Yeah. Right. You know, are you kidding? Under a capitalist system. Right. So, no, no can do. No, we're not going to wave her banner. We're going to say no one can be a slave. No one can be a slave. All right. right. Are we there? I think we're there. Okay, so uh, y'all should should read uh, Assad Hader's book. Mistaken oh. Identity, Race and Class in the Age of Trump, Assad Hader. It is short. It's 114 pages. You yeah. can do this. But I would actually consider when you get it, Just consider, six, consider yeah. reading it backwards. Six um, through one, not one read, through six. Yeah, consider reading the chat, not every word backwards, but <laughs> <laughs> consider reading the chapters in reverse order. Maybe that. Maybe you don't need that. Maybe you read yeah. the intro and, and the first chapter and, and you immediately fall in to, and maybe to his argument. Us, you know, yeah. you don't need to you have don't need the, that. the book reorganized. But, but, but that kind of, sometimes that kind of rearranging helps for me. Just yes. like, uh, call back. Just like, you know, deciding to go ahead and read uh, the Elric stories in publication order, which isn't right. the, the, the modern order right. that these new editions are coming out, publishing it in, made a lot more sense Made a lot me, more sense, right? yeah. All right. I still have to edit this. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you so much for reading all that. That was a, a lot to read. Oh, but, my pleasure. Uh, I'm glad you did. My eyes are, are given out tonight. Anyway, no worries. Thanks. Next week, guys. See ya. Bye. <laughs>